Good evening. This is the City of Everett Planning Commission meeting for Tuesday, June 16 of 2020. Welcome everyone. Uh, we'll, we'll first just go through a roll call and then I'll get through um, some instructions. So um, Kathy, if you could call roll. Sir, Chair Yanisak. Present. Commissioner Lavra. Present. Commissioner Holland. Here. Commissioner Tisdell. He may be without a mic. So I know that he's here. Commissioner Zelinsky. Here. Commissioner Beck. Here. Commissioner McGinn. Here. Commissioner Lark. Here. Commissioner Finch. Here. Here. All right. Thank you, everyone, for being here. Before we get started, there are some uh, some information I, I want to share here. We're obviously meeting in our remote format. Uh, the situation we are currently dealing with is constantly changing. And as part of the Governor's Safe Start Proclamation, the Planning Commission is conducting our meeting remotely. Unfortunately, we're not able to allow members of the community to gather in person to attend. But we do, we do want to protect you and your families and recognize the need for social distancing. We do encourage you to provide comments or concerns on any matter via email at planning at everettwa.gov. You may also watch the meetings on Comcast Channel 21 or Frontier Channel 29 or online at www.everettwa.gov slash Everett Channel Stream one word. You may also listen in telephonically if you do not have digital access. Please call 1-425-616-3920 and the conference ID is 186-469-349 pound sign. The public is allowed to participate via the same call-in number and conference ID. If you are accessing this meeting via phone, please be aware that there is about a 10-second delay on the broadcast and stream. If you wish to download the presentation materials or wish to comment and need to see the visual in real time, please visit the website everettwa.gov slash planning commission. I would like to remind anyone participating to please mute your microphone by pressing star six until called upon. And when it is time for public input, the last four digits of your phone number will be called out and you will be asked at that time if you wish to speak. Star six toggles the mute function of your phone. Please make sure that if you do speak, you do state your name and address as an introduction. Once finished, please mute yourself again. And if there are any disruptions or interruptions during the meeting, we do have an ability to uh, mute people uh, from our end. And um, we do hope that we don't have to do that, though. We do want everybody participating. Uh, thank you for your patience and understanding. We know these are challenging times, and we appreciate your willingness to be transparent and to continue to reach out to our community and keep everyone informed as we navigate through this time. With that, uh, let's move on to the approval of minutes for our last meeting, June 2nd. Uh, has everyone on the Planning Commission had a chance to review those? And if um, they have, are there any uh, comments or suggestions for changes? Okay, hearing nothing, uh, does anybody have a motion to, uh, to approve? This is Commissioner Zelinsky. I would move approval of the June 2nd minutes. Okay. Do we have a second? Uh, 
This is Commissioner Beck. I second the approval. The motion. Thank you. Thank you. Then, uh, Kathy, can you do a, a roll call vote? Yes. Uh, Commissioner McGinn? Yes. Commissioner Beck? Yes. Commissioner Zielinski? Yes. Commissioner Tisdale? Commissioner Holland? Yes. Commissioner Labra? Yes. Commissioner Yanisak? Yes. Thank you. Uh, let's go around. And are there any uh, commissioners who have anything to report or anything for for the commission? I guess maybe um, I'll just have an opportunity here to chime in if you if you have something. This is uh, Commissioner Lark. I just want to say greetings from uh, Korea. Oh wow, we have we have an, in, an international uh, attendance tonight. Great. Anyone else? I'm just curious what time it is in Korea right now. <laughs> it's 10.30 a.m. on Wednesday. The future is wonderful. We all have jetpacks. <laughs> all right. Anyone else? Okay. With that, uh, let's hear from staff. Does um, oh, sorry, did I hear something? Okay, okay. let's hear from okay. Beth. Alan. 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 Uh, thank you. Uh, I think, in the interest of time, we will we'll reserve staff comments until after the public hearings. Thank you. Thank you. Okay. Did um did, did David have something? Um, yeah, if, uh, if I could just do a, a quick update at the beginning, if uh, that's all right with, uh, with Alan. Of course. <laughs> uh, I, I, yeah, I, I would invite that, please. <laughs> okay. Uh, this is David Stalheim, Long Range Planning Manager, and uh, uh, welcome to uh, all the Planning Commission members and members of the public uh, watching uh, tonight. And... Um, and also across uh, the ocean over there in South Korea. So um, just wanted to give you uh, an update first off on some of the upcoming uh, Planning Commission things because members of the public may be interested in what's going on, uh, what's coming up next. And so I am going to um, share my screen here. And yeah, it worked. Um, so uh, this is kind of an updated schedule for the Planning Commission, the next uh, four meetings. Uh, so on July 7th, we're going to do more briefing on rethink zoning. Uh, we're going to pick up uh, and kind of go back on a few chapters. Uh, there's been some new state legislation that's been passed and some other things that respond to some uh, input that we've gotten from the public and the Planning Commission. And so covering uh, kind of a potpourri of uh, different chapters that you can see uh, on residential and central waterfront planning area, contract rezones, uh, definitions, off-street parking and landscape. And so a little bit of a potpourri of, of things on July 7th. Uh, on the 21st, uh, is when uh, we plan to bring the package of amendments to you for kind of a final briefing. Uh, my goal is most of all the chapters have been written at this time. Most of them are published on our website. Uh, my goal is not only to have them uh, virtually on the website, but the Planning Commission members would get a hard copy too in a three-ring notebook, and uh, we'll get that uh, delivered to you so that you can have hard copies of, of the uh, the code chapters and the summary documents that we put together for this, uh, for your meeting on July 21st. And so that'd be a final briefing. Uh, as you know, we have another docket application for Housing Hope uh, in the Norton neighborhood. Uh, and so right now we're scheduling that for August 4th. Uh, so that has some additional strong interest uh, from the neighborhood on that. And then going to public hearing, 
on rethink zoning on August 18th, um, along with an amendment uh, to our capital facilities plans for parks. So I just want to uh, get some of this uh, out in front of folks. Uh, I know August is uh, probably the worst time uh, in normal years to have meetings uh, and things. And so uh, if uh, planning commission members are not going to be around, please let Kathy know to make sure that we have a quorum. So before we uh, give any notices and stuff, I uh, just wanted to give you a little bit of a heads up on that. Uh, but with that, uh, I want to change to uh, another subject, which is uh, thank you uh, to both Alan Giffen and David Tyler. Uh, this is their last meetings uh, at the Planning Commission. And uh, just want to uh, let them know how much uh, everyone at the staff in the city appreciates their service uh, to Everett over the years. Uh, it's very unusual for, uh, I know Kathy's been there for a long time and and of course, Alan and, and Dave have been there a long time, but uh, usually these events, uh, for those who want the parties, uh, we have parties uh, in our planning department. And, and there's a story behind this goose, and at some point, uh, maybe Alan will uh, sing a song about it uh, to everybody. But uh, I never was around when the goose was uh, was floating around in, uh, in the department, but uh, there's I've heard some colorful stories about that at these parties. But Dave Tyler uh, has gone through two stints uh, with us. Uh, as you can see in the upper right, uh, he was a little bit younger when he, I think, first joined us. And uh, he's been uh, doing work in both the uh, land use and, and long range uh, over the years from uh, lots of land division uh, reviews to uh, long range planning over the last couple of years. And his service uh, to the community, uh, most of our pictures are uh, party related, but uh, we also have pictures of him uh, in the uh, uh, last public meeting that we had um, here just in February on Rethink Zoning down at the Weyerhaeuser Room and uh, his service to the public and to the community is just exemplary. So thank you, Dave, for all your service. Alan Giffen uh, uh, really did probably start as a planner here for Everett uh, in that lower right-hand corner. He probably was that young uh, when he started because he's been here for uh, I think it's 34 years, and so Alan's been around for a long time, and uh, and uh, his his service is just uh, incredible. But uh, over the years, Alan has contributed uh, in many different ways, from reviewing permits to long-range planning to leading the uh, planning department as the director for, and I forget the number, but I think it's somewhere around 17 years or something like that. Uh, it's been been a while that he's been leading uh, the planning function in Everett. And uh, so uh, Alan also likes parties and he likes red shirts. Uh, we have that uh, evidence uh, here, but uh, in the lower right-hand corner, by the way, this is one of the things we found in our archives was when Alan, uh, one of his uh, long range planning assignments, his first ones, I think when he moved out of land use was to rewrite the zoning code back in 1989, and uh, which is what we're doing with Rethink Zoning. And so there was a story about Alan uh, back then where he was rewriting it and uh, now uh, his task as, as he's leaving the city of Everett is to re rewrite what he wrote over the last 30 years. So Dave and Alan, you will be missed. You're a joy in the office, you're a joy in the neighborhood, and uh, we thank you for your service. Thank you, David. And um, yeah, I think everyone who uh, has, has seen them in action knows that there's there's um, been great contributors to the city and to the work that the department and the, the commission have done and um, imagine that maybe at the end of the meeting here we can have some some additional accolades we do have a rather full full agenda tonight um, so uh, we, we can come back to some of this at, at the end uh, I, we will uh, move on I, I, were there any other comments before I jump into any other staff comments? That's all. Okay. Um, so maybe let's move to item number one. Um, and just so people who are listening, if there are people um, from the community who are in attendance, just uh, what to expect here. We are going to hear a, a presentation about the um, the uh, about this issue here first from from staff. Then um, there'll be some time for the planning commission to ask some questions. We will then open it up for public hearing. At that time, we'll first ask for um, any input uh, or additional comment from the applicants or their representatives, and then uh, any other um, 
public comment. So if you're here for this item, uh, just uh, wait a little bit and there will be an opportunity to be called on. Uh, with that, let's go ahead and uh, Karen, I believe this is uh, the Hope Covenant Church property. Um, That's correct. Uh, good evening. Okay. And good morning to you, Alex. This is Karen Stewart, environmental planner with uh, the planning division. And I will put this in slideshow mode. Um, so the first two items on your agenda this evening relate to uh, private proposals for our 2020 comprehensive plan annual docket and they're the hope covenant church schmidt property and then the evergreen recovery centers summit campus the first uh site that i'll be talking about is uh, 2.46 acres and it is located on the west side of rucker avenue at the three addresses that you see there in the 4400 and 4500 block of Rucker Avenue. They comprise uh, eight parcels or 10 parcels total. Eight of them are owned by the Hope Covenant Church and the two northerly parcels are owned by Schmidt Investment Group LLC. The existing uses on the properties are a church, parking lot and driveway, two single family homes, as well as a commercial building uh, that uh, houses a dental, uh, professional services dentistry and chiropractic center. Here I've displayed uh, aerial photo um, on the left of the screen that shows the, um, the properties from above and the road on the west coming at an angle that's evergreen way and then the boundary road on the east side of the site is uh, Rucker Avenue and um, the yellow highlighter is showing the 10 parcels involved in this uh, requested changed for their comprehensive plan designation as well as the uh, implementing uh, zoning change. So for the uh, church owned parcels, the request would be to amend the comprehensive plan map from existing single family to multiple family and then rezone the property from R1 single family to R4 multiple family high density. The two northerly parcels currently occupied by a home um, are owned by Schmidt Investment Group and they would like to uh, extend further south their commercial building. So they need to amend the comprehensive plan from single family to commercial mixed use and then apply for the rezone from R1 to E1. So these are the maps that comprise the two exhibits um, that show the proposed uh, changes. So this first one is the comprehensive plan amendment. And in the center there, you'll see the commercial mixed use parcels are shown in purple. And then the multifamily is in the brown color. This exhibit number two to your uh, draft resolution is uh, illustrating the proposed zoning amendment. So the amendment would be to go from the uh, aqua color, again, single family detached low density to E1 Evergreen Way. And then the brownish uh, color is uh, indicating R4. So um, going from existing zoning of R1, single family detached low density to R4, multiple family high density. So the staff uh, reviewed the proposal and prepared a staff report that should have been mailed to the planning commissioners uh, in a packet. And it's also uh, posted on our website for others, uh, members of the public to re review. And in the staff report, uh, we noted that reasons to um, consider this 
to approve this would be that the properties abut the Evergreen Way, which is a major transit corridor. Um, there is commercial currently to the north uh, that proposed um, small expansion of the two uh, parcels um, would be for the existing dental chiropractic building um, and their parking lot. Uh, the church is looking at potentially selling the property to be re redeveloped in the future as multifamily. And this evening we might have uh, the applicants um, on the phone and they might want to speak to what their future plans are. Uh, the church property um, serves as a buffer transition for single family neighborhoods east of the site from the heavy traffic on Evergreen Way. But it is a single family neighborhood um, across the street on the east side of Rucker Avenue. And then the boundary to the south, there is really a natural boundary uh, consisting of a steep slope and wooded ravine. Uh, the staff report was prepared a while ago um, and it includes the required rezone narrative uh, prepared by the applicant. Staff recommends approval of these uh, proposed map changes. Uh, there have been no public comments received at the time of the staff report, nor am I aware of any um, any public comments. Um, nothing has come into um, my email. Um, so the Planning Commission is required to hold a public hearing on this matter uh, this evening, and then there is a draft resolution for your consideration. Um, again, though, the applicant may want to speak before you um, you ask questions. So, Chair Janicek, I'll pause here and um, let you see who would like to speak. Sure. I guess I'm not sure how we could identify them um, at this point, or, or perhaps Kathy already knows. But if there, if the applicant is present tonight or their representative and wanted to uh, address the commission, this would be um, an opportunity to do that. Uh, and Kathy, do we have a way of knowing if they're or identifying them? I, yeah, I don't have any way because I don't know who the applicant is, so. So can I chime in here? This is uh, Brian Callup from Insight Engineering. So I represent the applicant. Um, oh, okay. Uh, so I don't. Can you hear me? Yeah, we can hear you. Yeah, thank you. Maybe can you just say your name again and and and, and repeat who you're with. This is uh, Brian Callup from Insight Engineering. Okay. And we, so go ahead, Mr. Adam, uh, Chair. Yes. Uh, yes. let's, if we're going to take any input, including the applicant, let's open the public hearing then before you do that. Oh, okay. I'm sorry. You're perfect. That, can we have a, do we need a motion for that? I don't think you need a motion. Just, just declare the hearing open. Okay. Then at this point, because we're, we're taking comment, we will open the, the public meeting, um, on, on this matter, the, the public hearing on this matter, um, and we will then hear from the, the applicant's representative. Go ahead, Mr. Callum. Thank you, thank you. Um, well, I don't have a lot to say because um, I want to thank Karen um, and the other staff at uh, City of Everett for taking the application in and uh, doing the hard work that they do. Um, they have good staff reports. And it kind of outlines uh, everything we were thinking as far as why this is a good fit for the area, uh, for the multifamily in this area that's naturally buffered um, between Evergreen and Rutger and to the south there's a natural um, vegetated buffer to buffer us from the single family to the south um, and the commercial to the north so um, I really don't have a lot to say other than that and then staff recommendations I would open it up to questions uh, from the Planning Commission if they have any later Maybe since we have you, Mr. Callum, here, uh, I could open up now at this time. Is anyone on the, any planning commissioners have questions for 
Mr. Caleb, as the representative of the, the applicant. So this is Michael Finch. I have a few questions. Sure, go ahead. Uh, so I'm looking at the parcel map and the parcels on Rucker, 4516 Rucker, and um, the parcel immediately south. What is the what's the rationale uh, behind including those two in the rezone request? They, they currently appear to be single-family homes that are rented out. Yes, they're single-family homes. They're um, not in the best shape as far as uh, the houses. I concur. Uh, um, so they they need some work in order to be brought up to probably neighborhood standards. Um, so with the ownership of the property all being concurrent uh, with the church, we were thinking that it would be more valuable and you'd get more uh, housing if you included those properties in the multifamily. I see. And looking at the two parcels that are to the west of those single family homes, what is the depth, the average depth of those two parcels? The ones fronting uh, Evergreen and the interior parcel. Um, depth north to south or east to west? East west. I guess I don't have that information right. Okay. I guess the, the, the point of my question is to understand whether or not those two parcels that are fronting Rucker um, are are necessary or accretive to any redevelopment of the other two parcels further to the west. That, that was the point of my question. The other question I had was on 4524 Rucker, that seems to be um, a different owner. Was that owner contacted and asked to, uh, to join in this process? Yes, that owner had signed on the application and participated in this application. Okay, all right, so 4524, is proposed to be rezoned or is not proposed to be rezoned? The 4524 is supposed to be rezoned to commercial. Okay, I think that the map that we were provided does not accurately reflect that. Uh, and then finally, my question I'm looking at um, the 4502, the primary parcel. And it appears that uh, 45th Street Southeast um, bisects that. Does the Hope Covenant Church own that right of way? Was it vacated or is it still publicly owned? As far as I know, it has been vacated. Okay, great. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Thank you, Commissioner Finch. Any other commissioners have questions for the applicant? Oh uh, yeah, this is Commissioner Lard. I just have a, I just have a quick question. Um, given you know, I'm kind of curious, like the intent. What is the vision? Uh, you know, what, what are they seeking to have built in this space uh, in the multifamily density? And uh, you know, given the fact that they are, you know, I would say reducing. Uh, deteriorated housing stock, but it just still is affordable housing stock. Uh, you know, is there any vision in the application for, you know, the development of the space that would include taking advantage of uh, tax credits that come from providing affordable housing in that in that development site? Or is that too far down the line to even speak to? So currently at this time, we don't, we're still evaluating the plan for that. Um, we don't have a plan as far as uh, what's going to go in there, what what type of housing or what income. Um, we would not be able to do that on our own if this would be a for sale um, parcel or a partnership that we're looking at. Um, but we're still evaluating those, those proposals at this time. Thank you very much. Any other commissioners with questions? Yeah, Chair Yanisak, this is uh, Commissioner Holland. <clears throat> Go ahead. I was hoping staff. I, I was hoping staff maybe could weigh on on Commissioner Finch's question because there is a parcel that 
has a small single family home on it that's adjacent to this it's on the lower level so it's um you know the same <clears throat> anyway same elevation and not up the hill where that buffer hill is it's being left out of this proposed redesignation and so i guess the question for staff would be uh was that property owner contacted um it's, it's kind of a triangular looking piece and anyways it would be kind of out of place uh if this proposal was supposed to it would would move forward um that that property owner was not interested in joining in um i think they essentially want to keep living there um as is so i would suggest that um we're not we're not in a position to require that somebody be included with this annexation there's um uh, or, or the amendment rather. Um, so they weren't interested in rezoning their property at this time. Uh, they could in uh, future, the future um, decide that they perhaps would like to sell whoever um, eventually acquires this property um, and is looking at a redevelopment plan may, um, may come up with a, uh, an offer um and then they would have to rezone that parcel but at this time the property owner was not interested karen can you please move back to the site plan so everyone can understand the parcels that are being talked about here thank you let's see i don't know if i can point can you see my arrow here i believe we're talking about this uh parcel right here that has that has an existing single family home on it. Um, Any additional questions? Karen, did you have some additional um, information to present or are you finished as well? Um, I've completed uh, my presentation other than to direct the commission's attention after uh, you've heard from public comments that there is a draft resolution number 20-1 in your packet regarding this proposal. Okay. Are there any commissioners have questions, additional questions for, for Karen, for staff? Yeah, Carrie Ann, this is Commissioner Holland. Um, I'm going to have additional questions for staff, but I was hoping maybe we could hear from the public prior to that. Great. O okay. Any any other commissioners have questions for staff at this time? Okay. Why don't we go ahead and then open it up for for additional public comment if there's anyone on the line who is wishing to speak to to this item on on the agenda tonight uh, yeah, Kathy will call out I believe that's how we're going to do it we're going to call out a uh, last four digits of phone numbers and if your number is called and you are wishing to speak that'd be your opportunity to unmute your phone and go ahead and introduce yourself with your name and address and um, go ahead and make your make your comment at that time so Kathy do you want to can you run through the list? Yeah, I'll just go down my list. If you have no comments, just put no comments. Uh, if you are making comments on this matter, please give us your name and address for the record. The first one on the list is Ian Windham. Next, Linda Grant. No comment. So on this one. Thank you. Bill Wales. Uh, no comment. Raven Campbell. No comment. Uh, 7600.
Don Bush. Hello? Oh, excuse me. Hello, this is Ian, this is Ian Windham. Yes. I'm on the phone. I, I'm sorry, this is the first time I've done something like this. Did you have uh, comments on this matter? Yes. Okay. My name is my, Ian Windham. I own the the property directly south of uh, the Hope the Covenant Hope Church. At uh, my address is one three zero eight Maryland Avenue. And um, I'd like to be made clear on how this is going to impact the slope. Um, um, uh, for, uh, on this map here, it's showing the boundary between my property and the Hope Covenant property. The red line does not look like what I believe is my property line, because I've always believed that those huge maple trees belong to me. So I'm curious uh, what's going to happen there. And um, I'm curious how this is going to affect my view to the north, having an eight-story potential, eight-story building. Um, you know, we have a fabulous view from my property. Um, and I would like to know who I can talk to for this. That's about it. That's about it. Uh, uh, the view and the border marking on this map is uh, alarming. Over. Okay. Thank you, Ian. Okay, I'll, I'll let me uh, let me mute, and I'm listening on my computer. Okay. Okay. So guest uh, at extension seventy six hundred. Don Bushnack. No comment. Guest at seventy-one eighty-seven. Guest at three seven one four. This is Linda Erickson, and I live at fifteen oh three forty fifth Street Southeast. And first off, I, I did email Karen my comments because I adamantly oppose this. For the simple reason is. The traffic, okay, Rucker right now has a strip mall. It has the Totem restaurant, and it has the uh, Schmidt Clinic there. How are we going to take, and then the YMCA is at the end. So there's going to be a traffic problem on that street because it's only a two-lane street. So I was wondering, is the parking going to be on the west or the east side of Rucker? And um, how many units are there going to be? Are they going to be low income? And if they are low income, we're already, and my understanding is, you're already going to build low income apartments where the old Kmart building is on Broad, and then there's also low income apartments on Broadway. And currently, from on Hoyt, because I live on Hoyt, 45th and Hoyt, on Hoyt, from 41st Street to 45th Street, there are 12 apartment buildings. Four of them are low income. There's eight businesses, and then there's the YMCA. So I would like to know um, what the plans are and if we can see those. All right, thank you. Thank you. Next caller was zero one one zero. No comment. Next guest, T 
Tina Hokinson. Oh, that's loud. Oh, I'm sorry. <laughs> no comment. Guest extension 0296. Next guest, Casey Glennis. Next guest, Laura Gurley. No comment. Thank you, Karen. Next guest, Angela. No comment at this time. Thank you. Okay. And last extension I have is 6687. that's all the guests that I have. All right. Thank you, Kathy. Um, let me go back then. I know Commissioner Holland indicated that he might have some, some additional questions after um, we receive more public comment. So Commissioner Holland or any, anybody else, any other commissioners um, want to raise additional questions at this time? Uh, yeah. Thank you, Chairman Yannisak. Um, I'd like to hear, know if there's any more additional public comments and then maybe we could close the public testimony and then, uh, you know, have our planning commission dialogue with staff. Cause yeah, I do have several questions, but I, I didn't I wanted to get everybody an opportunity to talk before I, um, basically. Okay. Gave my thoughts. Let, let's do that then. So it sounds like we went through the list of everybody appreciate the comments that we did get. Is there anybody else that we at this time who's on the line who for whatever reason wasn't fast enough to, to, to respond or, or had um, additional comment that they didn't get to make? This is Tina Hokinson, um, 325 South Cabot. I do have one question about traffic. If a multi-unit uh, housing is planned for that little area where the church is, um, adding any additional access to Evergreen Way would be a problem, I think, in that area. And the road to the, the on the east side joins Evergreen Way at a skewed angle, which makes it difficult to access Evergreen Way from that intersection. So those would just be um, comments for future development there. That's a very tricky traffic area for adding more, more uh, vehicles. Thank you. Thank you. Any, anyone else? Okay, great. Well, I appreciate everyone, um, everyone's patience as we work through this, this remote process on the phone like this. At this time then, let's go ahead and close the, the public meeting and go back to uh, commissioners. So, uh, Commissioner Holland or anyone else who had additional questions or comments? Yeah, well, I'll, I'll move that we close the, the public hearing at this time. Okay. Thank you. It, um, do we have a second? Seconded. Who was that? Oh, Fisher Finch. Michael, Michael Finch. Yes. Okay. So let's go ahead and we ha have a vote, Kathy. Yes. Commissioner McGinn. Yes. Commissioner Beck. Yes. Commissioner Zielinski? Yes. Commissioner Tizzo? Yes. Commissioner Holland? Yes. Commissioner Labra? Yes. yes. And Chair Yanisak? Yes. Okay, thank you. Um, commissioners? In, in, any additional commissioner comment? Yeah, this is Commissioner Holland. Thanks, Terry Anisak. 
Uh, quick question. Um, I, I am going to have some additional comments. I, I have a uh, – I'm curious to why these two applications aren't separated out. I know that they're contiguous to one another. They seem to be two separate um, proposals based on the land use that is being proposed before us. Um, and I also just want to say that I, I do have a conflict because I'm family friends with the Schmidt, so I won't be able to <clears> – <throat> to uh, vote on this particular item this evening, uh, but I do have some strong opinions about the uh, uh, the Hope Covenant Church portion of this application. And so I was hoping maybe staff could uh, maybe answer why these were lumped in together other than the fact that they're contiguous properties. Uh, so this is Karen Stewart. Um, I will start with what I know, but perhaps, um, uh, David Stahlheim or Alan Giffen, who maybe had talked with the applicants before this uh, was prepared. Um, so the application, the official application had uh, these properties uh, listed together. My understanding um, was that they had been advised to um, submit the, the one application. Um, maybe just for ease of uh, processing, uh, but they are talking about or requesting different comprehensive plan designations as well as different zoning. Um, so we tried to, in our staff report, differ differentiate between the two and hopefully that was not too confusing. Any other staff have something to add regarding why they were combined? Yeah, this is uh, David Stalheim, and um, just um, the Schmidt family contacted us the year before for the docket, but they uh, had actually probably for about two years, and but they hadn't gotten uh, to the point of submitting an application. Uh, their interest was in uh, commercial development for the site, and my recollection was that when Hope Covenant Church first approached us, they were interested in the same zoning designation to be extended onto their property and so that's why we talked about uh, i talked to hope covenant church to talk with the schmidt uh, ownership group to combine things uh, but as we started looking at the application there was worries about commercial uses extending uh, further up onto the hope covenant church uh, partly because of some of the comments that have already been made in that neighborhood about additional traffic on the on the streets there because uh, a lot of that traffic would not be on Evergreen Way. It would be on the the main, uh, on the the backside of the property there, and and that would impact the residential neighborhood. So that's a little bit of the history, and there's nothing that precludes uh, them to be combined, I guess, in our our docket process. Mr. Holland, did you have more follow-up? Uh, well, yeah, sure. Uh, if I have the floor, I'll, I'll go ahead and talk about it. Um, go ahead. Again, as, as I stated, uh, I won't be uh, voting on this item tonight, but uh, I uh, echo some of the same concerns that uh, the public has had related to traffic. Um, specifically, I don't think that we want uh, a lot of multifamily traffic trying to get out into Evergreen Way if and when a future development application is submitted uh, at this location. I realize at this time it's a non-project action and just a redesignation, but they have already indicated that their hopes is to sell and, and redevelop for multifamily. I also have concerns about um, solar access for the properties across Rucker uh, Avenue to the east, uh, and we put in some large multifamily development there. I, I think that they would, um, and then the other gentleman that talked about losing his views, I know that we don't have, a, the city of Everett doesn't have a view protection ordinance, but again, those are uh, similar things that uh, I would have concerns about. Um, uh, there would be a lot of traffic generated from this type of development. I don't see any, um, I guess, the opportunity for walking to the buses to go down to 41st and cross at that location, but there are some other pedestrian types of concerns that I would have for a uh, a large multifamily development um, at the location that it is. We've got a lot of, I mean, I can see that there's signs posted up around the city quite a bit saying no mid-block crossing just because of those those concerns. Um, so those, and that and that other parcel not being included, it just seems like an out parcel that, uh, 
and I realized that the city doesn't, and they didn't want to be included in it, but it just seems to make sense that if there were going to be a designation change, that that, that parcel should be included because it, it, it's on the downslope of uh, of that. As you head up uh, Maryland there, it gets, it gets pretty steep. Um, so anyways, th those are my comments. Thank you. Any other commissioners with questions? Or uh, this is a uh, this is Commissioner Lark. Go ahead. Uh, I, I just a few thoughts, and you know, as I look at it, I mean, I mean, it is on a uh, it is on a high capacity you know road. It does have you know accessibility to transit, and I would really hope and encourage that the uh, that the um, that the developers look into that to mitigate these tra any sort of traffic concerns. Pushing people into more pedestrianized modes of mobility would be a good thing to do. But like you know, I think the broader question is like you know, I believe that this city needs to make space for housing, the space for growth. Over the last decade, you know, we lost 10% of economic growth because of the housing halls that we had that constrained you know, constrained people moving into places where there's economic opportunity. And to support the economic growth in the city, we need more people. One of the challenges that we have is that, you know, probably in the coming decade or so, the American will, the average American will have less disposable income. And to make sure that we have a thriving downtown, we need to have, you know, more people in our city supporting it. Um, and on top of it, we need to work to cultivate a thick labor market here in this city if we want to start landing large scale businesses. Making space for housing, making space for people, making room for new neighbors is an important and a priority. Uh, I would also encourage the um, encourage the, you know any future developer really engage in dialogue with the neighborhood to make sure that it is what is built there is a complement and a value add, um, and it requires it takes an input. But I think you know you if not here along the high you know high capacity corridor with transit that is within a walkable distance, um, you know where else can we expect to rezone? The city is full, and so we need to be thoughtful. And, uh, uh, you know, there's no undeveloped land. We need to be thoughtful in our way of approaching this. And I, and I think, you know, this is a space where you can, where you have room for doing that, where it meets goals that I think are needed for the city's growth and, and for the success of people in downtowns. And so, uh, to me, this makes a, a lot of sense. And while I, I recognize concerns articulated out there, I, I think they are not, they aren't concerns that, that won't be mitigate it through good through you know a good design process thank you commissioner lark any other commissioners with questions or comments uh this is commissioner beck i just have one comment um so this particular area actually has pretty intense traffic up by 41st and rucker where rucker becomes evergreen and i kind of i i'm with some of the residents there in terms of concerns about traffic and it's, I know that this is not a project, but I think a traffic study is in order in terms of concentration in this area. Um, it, it really gets backed up at various points in the day. And so I think that would be a lot of traffic potentially putting on this road, the, the diagonal road. So um, I have reservations about this one because I just don't know enough about the traffic. And that's my only comment. So this is David Stahlheim. And just uh, in your packet, just there is a preliminary traffic report from Gibson Consultants. Thanks, David. I didn't see that. I'm looking at the. OK, thank you. Any other commissioner questions or comments? Uh, Chair Yanisak, this is Michael Finch. I had a few other comments and questions. Please, please, thank you. So I, I really do appreciate the public comment uh, on this. I recognize this is a challenging format in which to comment and follow any meeting. And so uh, thanks for sticking in there. Um, I do think that the, the context of this site um, it does lend itself to uh, a potential rezone. But I think in light of the, the public comments, as well as any other speculations, it would be a lot easier to evaluate this site in the context of a project. Without a project-specific request um, or a development agreement, I think it's difficult to really address the, the public concerns um, that have been voiced 
Um, I don't necessarily agree with Mr. Lark um, as to the availability of development land in the city. Um, there is uh, there is a lot of, um, of land that is not developed to highest and best use, but has been rezoned to accommodate dense multifamily closer to the downtown core. So it's not a matter of opening up land for redevelopment um, to accommodate additional density. It's a matter of context and how that new development might fit into the existing fabric around it. And so that for me is, is my largest concern is without a specific project in mind to evaluate, um, it's difficult to really answer the questions that have been raised. And so I, uh, I appreciate the silence of the applicant uh, in the face of those comments. In looking at the specific resolution, there are a couple of points made on page two that I just I don't really understand. Um, uh, point number five says the proposed rezone mitigates any adverse impacts upon existing or anticipated land uses in the immediate vicinity. I, I don't know that where I sit today, um, I could actually say that truthfully. Um, I think the other uh, point that's raised in the resolution is that the proposed map amendments promote the best long-term interest of the upper community by allowing future multifamily residential infill adjacent to mass transit. Uh, adjacent might be too strong of a word, and I can think of other sites and locations that I would prefer to see development occur first. So um, I guess that if we do move forward with the resolution, um, I would request those voting members to consider um, modifying the language of the resolution. Thank you. Any, any other question or comments, Commissioner Finch? Any other, any anyone else? Yes, this is Commissioner Zelinsky, and I would just like to ask staff. Um, if this rezone were to be approved, what opportunities would exist um, going forward for either planning commission or neighborhood input into the specific layout and design of the site? Because it is an awkward site and how it's laid out will have go a long way to deciding what kind of impact it has on the neighborhood. So Karen Stewart, um, I'll start responding and if other staff have um, something to add, please feel free. Um, the gentleman, for example, who is talking about to the south of uh, the site and he was talking about the ravine and the uh, big leaf maples in that area. So the um, parcel boundaries are drawn including those areas. However, um, the ravine would be a critical area. And so there would be a setback um, from the edge of the ravine. So not all of the parcels are developable and um, the trees in the ravine would be preserved and presumably many of the trees would um, not be cut down, would not be allowed to be cut down. Now, in terms of um, a future development proposal, um, that would uh, prompt, depending on um, what the proposal is, uh, whether or not it's a, a staff review process, that we would take something to our hearing examiner with a public hearing. Um, certainly, the the application would neighbors would be notified of what was being proposed and oftentimes staff recommends to the applicant that they should meet with the neighborhood um, in a meeting prior to submitting their plans to try to work out uh, compatibility issues related to um, the height potential and the applicant in addition to the uh, trip generation report from Gibson that um, was included in your packet. There's also building envelope uh, drawings that were included relating to um, the topography of the, slide, the site and um, future uh, heights and stair stepping that would be required. So there would be obviously design um, review would be done by staff with potentially the hearing examiner um, also being involved. I'll pause there, see if there's uh, additional staff who 
want to uh, help answer the question. And I guess I could add on um, regarding uh, traffic and what improvements would need to be made at the intersection, depending on the number of trips that would be added, that would all be subject to um, a thorough review involving our traffic engineers um, to make sure that it would be um, meeting the required level of service and uh, 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 site distance considerations uh, I, I, and because of the topography uh, it's an elevated site there would not be um, access directly onto Evergreen Way so um, looking at Rucker would be um, a key consideration and just um, the, the usage uh, with the YMCA um, located to the south um, uh, all of that would have to be evaluated in a future um, uh, when an application was submitted with the future review project review. Commissioner Zelensky, did you have a follow up? Uh, no, that was a, a good answer. Thank you. Any other commissioners or with, with comments or questions? Yeah, this is Commissioner Holland. Go ahead. So uh, I, I know that uh, Commissioner Beck uh, mentioned about a, a TIA. So just reviewing what's in the packet there, there wasn't any intersection analysis done or anything else like that for a full uh, development package or anything like that. but. They did mention that it would generate uh, 712 average daily trips and 58 new and PM peak hour trips. Um, and they, they did not give AM trips, but I think that's an important um, one that would need to be analyzed as well, just based on location and where the major employment centers are. So, and again, as uh, Commissioner Finch uh, mentioned, without having an actual uh, you know, comprehensive plan map and concurrent rezone tied to a project, it's really difficult to know what those impacts are with those tra with with those trips, especially if, you know, they truly don't get a ride in, ride out on the Evergreen Way and everything's funneled onto Rucker. That's 712 new trips that are going to be snaking through that neighborhood, which I think is a is a tremendous impact on that uh, in that single family neighborhood. Thank you. Any, any, any other commissioners? Um, I'll just make one quick comment, too, because I was looking at the traffic report. Um, I don't think the Frontier Building, which is the office building that's over in this area, is near capacity right now either. I mean, so there's already significant amounts of traffic um, and there's already and there's vacancies over in the area. So I know this is a preliminary traffic report, but it doesn't really give a detailed analysis. And again, I understand that this can't happen without a project, but it's just difficult because uh, it's a little bit of a mess right now. So again, those are my thoughts. We're, we're, we already have some structures in the area that are not even close to capacity and the traffic is already a pretty significant issue. Any other commissioner comments or questions? Well, I, I'm Commissioner Yanisak. I do have a couple of questions for, for and hopefully Karen, you can answer these. It, am I correct? Did I understand that these are these properties are currently zoned R1 residential? That's correct. How did we end up with a commercial with a professional building and a church on R1 parcel? So um, I guess I didn't, I'm not sure what the zoning is of like the totem restaurant, which is the triangular parcel to the north, and then the next parcel, which is the commercial building. Presumably it's zoned commercial. Um, I, I haven't done research on those two. They were outside of the, um, the proposed area. 
but they're obviously developed as a commercial as commercial uses now and have um, the totem restaurant has been there a very long time the professional services building owned by the schmitz is more recent maybe within the last eight to ten years it was constructed do you know how long the church has been there um maybe 20 25 years um a long time okay and i guess what, I, what one question i have is i'm looking at these this property here and i and i appreciate that some of the issues have been raised by, by the neighbors and other commissioners here i'm wondering i mean if we did nothing this piece of property here it sounds like the church is potentially gonna wants to sell or if, i'm assuming that means they're no longer meeting there or using it as a church facility um it would seem to me that if there's pretty much the only person who would buy that would be someone who either wants a church or potentially to build a single family residence. Although I'm wondering how likely it would ever be that given that location, butting up to Evergreen Way like that, how likely that would ever be usable as, as single family. Um, I, I, I don't know. Did, did staff, or Karen, do you have any, thoughts on given that location there what what types of other uses could that currently could this property could ever be used for well I mean the the R1 zoning um, has a whole list of um, uses but it's basically the low density residential um, and I'm not sure with the church being there, obviously it can continue as a church. Um, I didn't personally meet with the applicants um, as uh, David Stahlheim is, it sounds like he's talked with them before. So I'm not sure if they were exploring um, some type of commercial use was what I heard initially. Um, but I, I'm sorry, I really don't have any more information. Perhaps, uh, the applicant's uh, representative, uh, Brian, um, with Insight Engineering, maybe has further background. I, I don't have any further information about that. Okay, and I guess one of the questions, so with the, with, if, if this rezone happened and, and it was approved for, for multifamily, um, what would normally be the, the height limit on something like that? Um, um i do not know that off the top of my head david but Stahl, i guess I, you know? i was gonna say seven stories but i could be wrong i don't have a height map right in front of me and i guess what i'm what i'm ultimately wondering is given it's, it's given that it abut it would abut up to residential um properties on on at least two sides um i assume that that would limit there would be some limits on the height given the, the required setbacks and um, the size of, of the parcel i, I can't quite get a, a sense for that though i guess i'm wondering would, would would even if that is the maximum height would it ever be achievable on that property in any event maybe if, for if the portion, able to tell? perhaps for the portions that are um adjacent to uh evergreen way so the most westerly portion perhaps, and then it could step down um, to, uh, as it had, as the development, um, and obviously they'll have to have parking too. So there could be more of the um, parking lot um, on the east side of the parcel. But again, this is all speculation because there's no development proposal before us. Karen, if you could uh, close out your screen and I'm going to share uh, part of the application screen for a sec. I will if I can figure out how to do that. Just hit the little X box. I don't have. Oh, in the in the share box. Go to your share box and you I should don't. Have an my share box is not displayed. I'm in the slideshow view. I don't know how to get my share box. My um. I'm sorry. I don't know how to do that. <laughs> okay, I'm gonna request control right now. So just uh, let me take control. 
Okay, I see that that popped up. I'm allowing that. If I may. Pippa, please. Um, Karen, yes. please go to the Teams app. So you can ignore your presentation and press escape right now and then go to. The OK, is somebody that... else is driving here. Okay, go ahead, David. You got it. Yeah, so so I got. Uh, so this is uh, in the record in front of folks uh, to try to answer uh, Chair Yanisek's questions about the height. So the current code, uh, I'm going to um, go to the code, which says that you can go up to 80 feet. But then there's a footnote that, that talks about that uh, distance of how tall a building can be within proximity of the single family zones can only be 28 feet when within 50 feet of the single family zones or R2. And so this drawing that the applicant submitted as part of this, here's Rucker Avenue, here's Evergreen Way. Uh, you start seeing what that potential building envelope could be uh, in these areas compared to the existing church. And so that's just a large massing diagram there, uh, not a design drawing clearly, but uh, um, anyhow, that uh, gives you a sense of what the basic framework of the code allows. Thank you. That that that's helpful. I guess I did have one other question. Then um, I, I appreciate concerns too about potential uh, traffic impact, but I would think that uh, if there was a specific proposal made, that certainly be something that would need to be addressed. I guess my question is, um, are are how common is it for project applications to be denied due to um, not being able to either satisfy the you know traffic concerns or I, I guess make ne make necessary improvements to to that is that a basis that that projects could be limited or or, or denied application or is that a matter for the hearing officer usually yeah so this is David Stelheim again so so projects um, quite often are not I wouldn't say denied but if they cannot meet the engineering requirements and the concurrency requirements uh, through mitigation, then then they're, they don't go forward. Usually a project will either get scaled back where uh, the number of units and the traffic generated will be changed or there'll be improvements to intersections and turning movements and lights and you know whatever else is necessary in order to meet the, uh, the city's engineers requirements for, for access for that. So those are all adopted standards. And so the development project goes through that process and it has to meet the city's development standards before it's approved. Thank you. And I guess what I'm getting at is I wonder if the, the, the topography and just the size and the location of these concerns raised would just in and of itself naturally create some, some, some limits to how the property could be redeveloped if this uh, zoning application were to be, be approved today. So. Um, Commissioner Fins, did you have some additional comments or questions? No, no additional comments. Um, I guess the, the questions I had about what uh, number five and, um, and number six and seven in the um, proposed resolution mean were not answered. And I'm curious to know if staff wanted to explain what is meant by those. Okay, Karen Stewart. Um, so this is a draft resolution. Obviously, you need to modify it um, as you as you see fit. Um, these were uh, this is standard language five, six, and seven with um, these types of applications. Um, uh, I believe that six and seven that this wording uh, might be in our code um, of needing to make this these types of determinations. Um, number five, in terms of um, adverse impacts that would relate because it's a non-project action. Uh, just changing the zoning on the map, but then trying to anticipate what some of the future uh, adverse impacts would be, such as 
um, shading due to height. Um, so th that there would be a SEPA review that would be a State Environmental Policy Act uh, review on any proposed application. And so adverse impacts would have to be uh, mitigated below the level of significance. So that would relate to number five. Um, I would hesitate. So number five potentially does not need to be included in your resolution, but I would hesitate uh, to advise you that six and seven are optional because I've seen that standard wording um, in all the rezone um, uh, decisions that I have reviewed. Uh, so I would advise to keep six and seven in and make some sort of um, uh, adjustments to the wording if it's more editing, um, but that the spirit and the sort of that's captured in six and seven um, should be part of your your discussion and your consideration should you choose to approve some version of the proposals. Thank you. Any addition, any addition, oh, any other commissioners with questions or comments? Okay. I guess any additional staff comments before I we, we, we turn to the um, resolution? Um, not for me. I'm I'm trying to think if I answered uh, the citizen um, comment questions. Um, we talked about traffic. Um, I Karen, let me let, let me just confirm. You you're, you would be the staff contact for. Uh, Public, if they want to contact the um, planning department to, with questions about this. Uh, after so the my meeting my well. role right now is um, uh, evaluating the subject of this resolution. So the docket request, which is the conference of plan land use map changes and zoning changes. Um, I don't have, I, and I probably would not be the planner assigned to review a multifamily proposal on this site. That would. Be somebody else probably so um, okay. but as for as for as for questions potentially about the the application is, is that you I know that was one of the questions that one of the public commenters asked a future I guess they, they, they could just con you no mean, I'm talking about this, this 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 for this application so I guess I, I would just say if, if there's someone from the public would um, to answer that question just to, to they could call the planning department and, and just oh okay ask the yes. question yes okay so um, planning commissioners, we do have this um, resolution 20-1 uh, in front of us tonight. I don't know if there's any um, anybody wanted to make a motion or, or have any thoughts about wanting to move that forward in this in, in current form or in some different form. Uh, Cherry Anasek, this is Michael Finch again. One question for you. Um, in looking at uh, having driven the sites, uh, looking at the map, looking at the adjacent uses, um, I guess not that I'm voting tonight because it's I think that we're all here and so therefore I'm not needed to vote. But um, I guess it's e it would be easy for me to approve a rezone of the uh, commercial mixed use site at the north of this assemblage. Um, I think there are significantly more questions surrounding the proposed change to multifamily um to the south and so is it possible to break up um, this proposal into the two components that reflect the different land uses or um, is the commission required to go forward and evaluate the proposal in front of them well, I, I would defer that question to staff i mm -hmm. i i not sure um david stahlheim do you do you have an opinion on that? <laughs> um, let's see if uh, our planning director wants to yes. weigh in on this. Okay. Yes, this is Alan Giffen, uh, planning director. Uh, the commission does have the discretion to decide how to um, uh, act on this uh, particular application, even though that's a single application, but with different ownerships. 
you have the discretion to uh, recommend approval of a part of it uh, or all of it or none of it. And, and so uh, that's a uh, fair game for your discussion. You can, you can uh, make a recommendation that uh, you feel is in the best interest of the uh, community for the um, property there. Does that answer your question, Commissioner Finch? <laughs> it, it does. It does answer my question. And I guess uh, I'm not sure. Again, it, 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 go ahead. Go ahead. Oh, I was going to say I'm not sure it provides a, a clear a clear path um, moving forward, though. <laughs> um, right. Agre agreed. I'm again. I'm I'm an alternate, and I don't believe I'm voting this evening. Um, so it would be somewhat awkward for me to make a recommendation that we bifurcate these uh, these parcels or the resolution. Um, but it's just clear to me that uh, the, I believe it's the Schmidt owned parcels to the north, given the um, adjacency to the north and south of the parcels in question, um, that's an easier question than the multifamily rezone. And, and I guess I would just say that I, 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 I agree that, that this, with that as well. I guess I would just say back is it for whatever reason, the, the, the the parties did join in presenting a single application. Um, at the very least, I would I would think that it would be appropriate for us as a commission, if if we did want to bifurcate this and that we at least provide some additional guidance or make some sort of comment to uh, perhaps the remaining applicant about what we would think would be the next step forward, or provide, I guess provide some some additional. Um, I guess maybe present some additional plan for for moving forward with the with the remaining part of it, if that was even something that we did. Um, I think that Mr. would be helpful Chair, to everybody. Go ahead. Yes. Uh, Alan Giffen, Planning Director. Uh, it's it's not your job to advise the applicant how to proceed with some alternative uh, plan. Uh, you're free to give them advice advice if you wish, but you don't you don't have to. However, if you are going to uh, for example, make a recommendation to the, the city council to approve a portion of the rezone but, and, and comp plan amendment, but not the other, then uh, you should be uh, backing that with findings of the reasons why you would not support uh, rezoning or changing the comp plan on another portion of the site. Thank you. So did, is there any commissioner who has a I guess any other question or comments or a motion or something to move forward? Uh, this is Commissioner Zelensky. I'll take a shot at a motion. Um, this is okay. a very difficult site as we have all gathered in our deliberations. Um, I don't think the R1 makes much sense for property that butts up against a high capacity transit corridor. Uh, on the other hand, I have a lot of sympathy for the concerns expressed by by some of the residents about the traffic impacts of a high density multifamily. So unfortunately, we have to make a decision on this one and I'm persuaded by uh, the, the comments that Commissioner Lark made, as well as the overall constraints of the site. Um, and so therefore, I'm going to uh, move that we approve the recommended comp plan amendment and rezone uh, as proposed, but with the resolution modified to delete the, that sentence five on page two, because Frankly, I I don't buy it, <laughs> and I thought of maybe modifying it, but I think the best bet would be to simply delete it. So that is my motion to approve the the resolution with the elimination of that sentence five. Thank you, Commissioner Zelensky. Any um, we have a second for for the motion. I second. This is Commissioner McGinn. Okay. 
with that, let's go ahead and move to a vote. Uh, Kathy, can you call through? Um, Commissioner McGinn? Yes. Commissioner Beck? No. Commissioner Zelensky? Yes. Commissioner Tisdall? No. Commissioner Holland? Again, I must abstain because I'm a family friends with the Schmidt. So. Commissioner Lavra? <laughs> oh, goodness. Yes. Darianna Thack? Yes. Thank you. Thank you, everybody. Thank you, uh, people, everyone who commented. Um, let's we are um ready to move on to item number two i believe on the agenda that's correct and i believe okay, is that is, sharon again yes it is okay so okay. this is a second uh private um property uh docket proposal and this is uh the evergreen recovery center summit campus um and this is uh, approximately 1.22 acres. Um, Karen, Karen, sorry to yeah. interrupt, but you need to share your screen again. Oh. So I think I'm going to have to close out because I don't have, unless people or somebody can help me, I don't have the, because I'm in the slideshow, so I assume I need to end the show and queue it all up again in order to get the, um, prompt that allows me to share my screen is that correct can you press alt tab and it shows you all the software that you have on um okay yes that worked okay. go to thank teams you, thank you. and share it that way yes. thank you All right, sorry about that. Um, I am learning as I'm going here. Okay, so does everybody see my screen now? Yep. Okay. Yeah. All right, uh, Evergreen Recovery Center Summit Campus um, up in uh, North Everett, north of uh, um, Everett Avenue. So this is a, a proposed expansion of the Evergreen Recovery Center, um, existing uses on a portion of the 1.22 acres is a multifamily housing and treatment center with a parking lot and then single family homes are in the parcels um, uh, to the west. The proposed uses and they would be subject to a future development agreement between the city and the applicant would be to um, expand the summit campus to the west with two new multifamily buildings um, offering integrated therapeutic daycare with each building serving up to 16 mothers and their children for up to a six month stay. And here's a map that um, illustrates the the um, existing summit um, campus is on the easterly parcel, so the east subject properties labeled on the map there. And then the single family homes across the street to the west are um, owned by um, Evergreen Recovery Center um, and are propo proposed to be part of this uh, action. Here's a aerial photo um, of the existing facility here. Um, and then Summit Avenue, this is I-5 here, and the sound wall, and then uh, single family homes here. The request is to amend the comprehensive plan map from single family to commercial mixed use and to rezone, change the zoning from R2 to single family detached medium density. 
uh, from, excuse me, from R2 single family detached medium density to C1 general commercial, and this would allow expansion of the existing facility. So here's the proposed um, uh, comprehensive plan changes in context so that you can see where commercial uses are to the south of the site on either side of Everett Avenue. And then to the east is single family. To the north is single family. However, north of 26th Avenue um, is a existing church, uh, uh, which is somewhat um, interesting compared to the last one where it's um, a church that's R1 zoned also. And then the corresponding request for the zoning amendment to allow expansion of the facility would be to go from single family detached medium density to general commercial. Uh, staff prepared a staff report um, addressing the merits of the, the requests and um, it notes that there's also a, a as required a rezone narrative and in the narrative the applicant uh, explains about how this will facilitate and allow expansion of the uh, social service um, and this is a facility that has been in that area area on Summit Street for decades. Um, the logical boundaries are proposed as we saw on the earlier map. Um, and then looking at the this block area of Summit Avenue, it generally has more characteristics of commercial mixed use than single family uh, because of the existing facility there and commercial to the south and the large church to the north. The applicant intends to limit commercial uses to residential and institutional uses through a future development agreement with the city to ensure neighborhood compatibility. Um, public comments have come in since uh, the staff report was prepared and there have been three emails supporting this proposed um, uh, um, uh, amendment as well as supporting the existing facility and noting um, uh, that it's a good neighbor um, with with the neighborhood in the area. So staff recommends approval of these proposed map changes and as you did with the uh, prior docket request this is uh, subject to a public hearing. So I'll turn it back to you Chair Yanisak. Thank you. With that, let's go ahead and open the public meeting. And perhaps first we can see if, um, well, I guess, first of all, do we have any uh, planning commission issue questions for, for Karen? Uh, yeah, this is uh, Commissioner Lark. Uh, first of all, can you guys hear me OK? Uh, my internet was a little choppy earlier, and I want to make sure I'm coming through clear. So thumbs up. We hear you all. Fantastic. We hear you. Good. Uh, so I'm kind of curious, like what kind of public outreach and community engagement was done by the by the agency leading up to this? Uh, you know, pr in previous conversations we've had, we, we've talked about this and we've also talked about the perils of like statutorily uh, articulating what we expect. And so one thing I'd be really interested in doing is starting to hear what best practices are or what or, you know, what agencies have done for projects, uh, for things like this. And so it, it could, do they speak to that at all? I don't see anything initially in the, um, in the application or are they here to speak to that, if I may? I'm not sure who's on the line. Uh, certainly the applicant has uh, representatives and they're aware of the meeting tonight. So they may be on the line, I'm not sure. Maybe if this would be opportunity, if someone is on the line from um, Evergreen or, or one of their representatives. It looks like Linda Grant. Ms. Grant, is, is she on the line? Yes, yes. Can, I oh. unmuted. Can you hear? Yeah, go, go ahead. We can hear you. Yes, thank you. Did you, did you hear the question? I'm the CEO at Evergreen Recovery Centers, and uh, our organization has 
notified the neighborhood and we actually were scheduled to be on the neighborhood association agenda back in, I believe it was March, but because of COVID or maybe it was February, at any rate, that meeting had to be canceled. And so we didn't get to meet personally. I also have met with the county councilmen from that district. Um, is that the question you're asking about the kind of outreach we've done? Uh, well, I, I think that's, that's, about that's, our uh, treatment program. Um, actually, no, you're, you're, you're referring to the, the kind of outreach that I was, that I was asking about. So, you know, I just wanted to confirm you've reached out to city council people for the, uh, in the district or you said county council, right? Mm-hmm. And then you've also reached out to the neighborhood association. And do you, did you have any, just with regards, was there any sort of engagement or dialogue with bringing them into any sort of component of the design process? For me, I'm a huge fan of the pomegranate yeah. centers method. We, we had some casual conversation about that and our intention is to include that. Uh, we have apartment building looking buildings there. So we have tried to honor the nature of the community we're in and would continue to do that. And one of the major goals of our expansion is to build a bigger daycare so that we can have more children on site with their mothers instead of 12, which is what we're limited to right now. So that goes with it, some play areas and some, some um, common, more parky areas. And uh, we're up against the freeway. So that provides us with good sound control. It, it actually doesn't carry sound as much back toward the freeway. So we're, we would be sensitive to that anyway, but we absolutely intend to include them. We've worked with the neighbors for many years and um, often are recipients of their Christmas baskets and things. They're, we have a great relationship. Excellent. Thank you so much. I, I, I appreciate that. I appreciate that input. Uh, thank you so much. Thank you. Any other commissioner comments or questions? Ms. Grant, since we do have you on the line, did you have anything you wanted to add to the presentation? Um, well, I don't need to jump ahead of the staff. They did a beautiful job of summarizing this, and it's a complex situation. We have been on the campus area since 1972 um, and providing uh, residential treatment as well as detox. This year, we changed our detox and we only have the moms and children there. So it's a completely family oriented environment. And um, one of the things the neighbors often say is they really like seeing our moms and their babies taking their strollers and going for a walk each day. And these mothers are with us for about six months and completing a program that sort of reinforces their parenting and prepares them for going out in the world, uh, getting employment, permanent housing and they're mostly local girls they um, live in the area we serve some from North Sound but the primary group of them comes from the Snohomish County area I could say more but you probably don't need I don't want to overstate and bore you <laughs> okay well thank you I guess at this time then if there's anybody from the public who wanted to address the commission. I'll have Kathy call through and um, give you that opportunity. Okay. Uh, remember to unmute yourself if you're using the app or star six if you're using your phones. Uh, first guest is Casey Glennis. Next guest, Don Bushnack. I'm with the applicant and I don't have any comments. Thank you. Next guest, Ismail Mohammed. Next guest, Laura Gurley. Next guest, Tina Hokinson. 
Sounds like a great project. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, extension 7600. Extension 0110. I'm with the applicant. I have no comment. Thank you. Extension 2394. Yes, this is Susan Secor. I'm a neighbor a few blocks over on East Grand. And um, in reviewing the um, their application, this seems to be a request for rezoning that's um, based on a development agreement. Um, however, uh, that, that includes re restrictions. That agreement hasn't been formed. Um, and what the applicant says is, um, you know, that uses are limited to the things that we expect with this project. Um, and it says including but not limited to those things, multi-family housing, supportive housing, daycare, and social services. Um, to say including but not limited to would seem to leave the door wide open to any number of other things that they might do with a, 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 a C1, um, a change to a C1 zoning. Um, that, um, that would seem quite unacceptable, I would think. Thank you, Susan. Uh, next extension 7187. That ends our guest list. Okay, thank you. Um, any uh, um, additional uh, questions or comments from the uh, commissioners at this time? Carry on a second. This is Michael Finch. Go ahead. Uh, so, a question about the um, the patrons um, for ERC post expansion. So, approximately, what percentage or expected percentage will be from Everett, as opposed to uh, broader Snohomish County? Um, well, sometimes they're from broader Snohomish County, but they end up settling in Everett. So I would say that it's somewhere in the neighborhood of 50 to 60 percent that are ever resident to begin with. Great. Thank, thank you for that. I appreciate it. Any, any other commissioners? This is Commissioner Lavra. Go ahead. Oh, well, I was just going to say I drove uh, through the site, looked at the commercial development which I'm somewhat familiar with on Everett Avenue. And uh, the site looks very well maintained, their current facility. Uh, it seems like a reasonable project for the area. That's my comment. Okay. Any other commissioners? Uh, if I may ask a quick question um, to the applicant. So like, like my previous employer, Housing Hope, one of the challenges we encountered uh, was that you know some of our some of our funding mechanisms restricted our capacity, like restricted our discretion on like who we admit from what geographic areas. Do those similar uh, funding restrictions also uh, apply to some of the like, some of the grants that fund and support your organizations? The at this point in time, all of the. Um, Women are funded under Medicaid treatment under the Medicaid health care plan, and we contract with the health care plans for the North Sound region. So that's pretty much our 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 um, our area that we draw from. And there are treatment centers in Eastern Washington just like this, and they stay over there. And there are treatment centers in the south part of the state that serve this population. So that's why it tends to be local. And then often they have children and family nearby that we, is really helpful to have them stay connected to or develop closer uh, repair relationships, shall we say. And so 
the the pregnant and parenting mothers tend to stay in the area that they came from. Oh, Roger that. Thank you so much for that insight. Any other commissioners with questions or comments? Uh, Chair Janicek, this is Michael Finch again. Um, yes. Uh, I'm not voting tonight, but I uh, I have driven the site and the vicinity. Um, and in reviewing the proposed project and rezone, um, you know, given the context of this site, I think that the proposal um, is a good one. Uh, my only comment would be that in the draft resolution, uh, item number six on page two, it notes that the proposed map amendments promote the best long-term interest of the Everett community. And I think that while that is true, um, I also think it's worth recognizing that this is a, a regional facility. Uh, it, it appears to be well-run, well-maintained, um, and um, a service to the region, uh, the county at a minimum. And um, I think at some point we need to recognize that um, Everett as a city um, has taken on a significant portion of the, uh, the county services that other cities choose not to take on. So while I am supportive of this rezone, I do think we should acknowledge um, the place that, uh, that Everett as a city is taking relative to meeting the regional demands. Thank you. Any other commissioners questions or comments? Anything Chair additional? Jack, this is, uh, this, yes. this is uh, Commissioner Holland. Just if there's no additional public testimony, I would uh, make a recommendation to close the public hearing. Do we have a second? I'll second that. Commissioner Beck. That was Commissioner okay. Beck. Yeah. Sorry. Okay. Let's go ahead and, and go go to a vote then. Kathy, vote to close. Motion to close. Uh, Commissioner McGinn? Yes. Commissioner Beck? Yes. Commissioner Zielinski? Yes. Commissioner Tinsel? Yes. Commissioner Holland? Yes. Commissioner Lavra? Yes. Gary yes. Adams Beck? Yes. Okay, with that, uh, any additional um, commissioner comments, questions, or motions? This is Commissioner Beck. I actually would like to go ahead and move uh, and recommending a resolution recommending the City Council amend the comprehensive plan, land use designation, and zoning at 2601, 2604, 2606, 2612, 2614 Summit Avenue as part of the annual docket for 2020. Okay, and I believe that would be Commission Resolution 2002. Correct. Um, as proposed. Okay, do we have a second? I'll Commissioner Holland that. will second that. <laughs> Commissioner Holland seconds, thank you. Let's go ahead and move to a vote. Kathy, can you call through again? Commissioner McGinn? Yes. Commissioner Beck? Yes. Commissioner Zielinski? Yes. Commissioner Tisto? Yes. Commissioner Holland? Yes. Commissioner Labra? Yes. Carrie Beck? Yes. Thank you. Okay, thank you everybody. That would conclude uh, agenda item number two. We have the next item is our floodplain management. Is that Steve? Yes, that's me. All right, you have the floor. Thank you. Good evening, commissioners. I have a PowerPoint point to share here. So I'm Steve Inglesby. I'm with the planning department. I'll give you a little bit of background uh, about the uh, National Flood Insurance Program. Hey, Steve, uh, could you just take a pause there? It looks like Karen's screen is still on. She needs to get up.
Oh. Okay, can everybody see that? Am I on? I can see you, but not we can't see your screen. Can't see my screen. Hmm. No, we see you. <laughs> All right, let's try it again. Here, I'll. Is that working now? There you go. Yes, thank you. Great. All right, so Chapter 30 of Title 19, Regulations for Flood Damage Prevention. So the city entered the National Flood Insurance Program in the 1970s. Uh, there's a, there are 52 policies uh, for the uh, landowners within Everett. And so far since the 70s, nine uh, insurance claims have been paid for a total of $230,000. So chapter 30 regulates areas that are subject to periodic flooding. Uh, the aerial on the left is of the city. The areas in green are uh, areas that flood and the area in the blue is um, a floodway. So FEMA has issued a new flood insurance study and flood hazard maps. Uh, the flood hazard maps are called flood insurance rate maps and they become effective on June 19th of this week. So if the regulations that, uh, uh, if the regulations do not comply with uh, the national flood insurance program requirements, property owners will not be eligible for flood insurance. So uh, last week, City Council adopted the Interim Flood Damage Prevention Ordinance on June 10th. Uh, this ordinance that they adopted replaces the Chapter 30 that was titled Floodplain Overlay Districts and Regulations, and they were established in 2005. <clears throat> so uh, the 2005 um, regulations no longer complied with the requirements of FEMA's National Flood Insurance Program, and that is why we uh, have done the updates. So uh, key changes from the 2005 regulations are as fol follows. Um, I, I should back up and say that we uh, are adopting or, or kind of duplicating, I should say, the state, uh, the 2019 state model ordinance. So the, the changes, key changes are the uh, overlay zoning districts that we currently have for a few more days, uh, the floodway, urban, fl urban flood fringe and rural flood fringe uh, districts, their descriptions and permitted uses will be removed. Uh, the reasons for that is that those areas are described with uh, within the FEMA's uh, flood insurance rate maps, and so uh, there's no reason to duplicate there. Uh, definitions, we will be duplicating the uh, National Flood Insurance Program definitions. So it's just really an update for the definitions. Um, let's see, the lowest floor for residential and non-residential buildings are required to be elevated to one foot above the base flood elevation rather than our current regulations, which require two feet. Uh, this would match uh, what the state model ordinance shows. Uh, the base flood elevation is the elevation to which flood water is anticipated to rise during the base flood. And the base flood or the 100-year flood is a flood that has a 1% chance of being equal or exceeded in any given year. <clears throat> also, other changes, the allowance to increase the water surface elevation of the base flood of one foot at any point in the community within the floodway will be replaced with a no rise within the floodway. Uh, so there's, there should, should really no, there should not be any net fill allowed within the floodway. This is really a requirement that shouldn't have been allowed in, in the first place in our, our, our code. Uh, another update is standards added for the VE zone. 
That's the coastal high hazard area. And uh, that's along the coastline and accounts for storm surges and wave action. Uh, another change uh, is the applicable density fringe area regulations from the Snohomish County will be adopted that will apply only to the density fringe area on the flood insurance rate maps. The density fringe applies to the Smith Island estuary. So the density fringe is just something um, that applies to the Snohomish River Basin that's not found in any other FEMA uh, re requirements. So uh, yeah, it just applies to these restoration areas here on the, on the left, and there's no other density fringe in the city. And here's uh, the, firm, uh, the firm panels. There's about 10 of these um, throughout the city. Um, and these FEMA maps uh, can be found on their website uh, through this uh, website here. Um, they are currently pending until June 19th, and uh, they'll be the official maps. Here's an example of uh, the current maps and what's uh, pending that'll be adopted in uh, a couple days here. So on the left is the pending maps, on the right is current. Um, there's not uh, a lot of changes. You'll see the, the floodway here and the diagonal lines, the uh, a, zone AE with the 100-year the floodplain elevation of approximately 12 feet and uh, the VE zones further uh, south to the, uh, uh, yeah, further south to the west. And this information is found on these uh, panel maps. So the uh, main changes to the flood maps are that the maps have been con the maps have been converted from the National Geodetic Vertical Data. Uh, NGVD 29 to the North American Vertical Datum of 1988, the NAVD 88, and the difference between those two elevations is approximately 3.64 feet. And so converting uh, the conversions on the maps are about the same uh, uh, rather than all oh, the 3.64 foot difference, but there, there's in some areas a four inch difference uh, of a rise of the base flood elevation. <clears throat> um, so, uh, uh, last slide here. FEMA will begin another update to its maps of the, after further analysis of the levees along the Snohomish River's lower basin. So they have this note on, on their maps, uh, for the maps, uh, the panels along the Snohomish River that says more studies are needed for the uh, existing levees. So probably that's uh, uh, several years out before that happens. So that uh, concludes my presentation. Thank you, Steve. Any commissioner comments or questions for Steve? Okay, hearing none, let's, I, I will um, open the public hearing on this matter uh, before the commission tonight. Uh, I don't know if we have anybody from the public who wanted to comment, but um, now would be the time. Kathy, can you call through the, our guests? Sure. Um, Casey Glenis. Here. Casey Glenis. Here. Casey Don Bushnack, Ismail Mohammed, Laura Gurley, Tina Hokinson. No comments. Thank you. And extension seven one eight seven. That ends the guest list tonight. Okay. Um, 
any other commissioners have questions or comments during the for the public hearing? Uh, this is Commissioner oh. Hall, and I uh, I would move that we uh, close the public hearing. We have a second. Who made that motion? I'm sorry, was that Commissioner Lavra? Yes. Okay. Motion and second. Can we have a vote? Who seconded? Commissioner Lavra, I believe. Who who did the first motion? Uh, Commissioner Holland moved to close. Oh, that's what I thought. Thanks. Okay, vote. Commissioner McGinn. Yes. Commissioner Beck. Yes. Commissioner Zelinsky. Yes. Commissioner Tisdale. Commissioner Holland. Yes. Commissioner Lavra. Yes. Ariana Fack. Yes. Thank you. Okay, thank you and thank you, Steve. That concludes uh, item number three. Our last item uh, on the agenda here is rethink zoning. And I believe yeah. is this date. Oh, wait, wait, wait. Oh, I'm sorry. Terry yeah. Anasak, we still got it. We we still have to. We have a resolution. Oh, we have a, we have a vote. Oh, I'm sorry. <laughs> That's correct. That was a vote to close the pub public public hearing. I, I apologize. Um, so the, the public hearing is closed. Any additional comments or, or questions from the from the commission? Then. I'm no, I'm any good. motion. This is Commissioner, Commissioner Lavra. Lavra. I, I, I move that we approve the, approve the resolution, the resolution with one edit. With edit. I discussed okay. this with Steve today. There was one one um, area where just the numbering had been changed and it uh, was referring to numbering that had been changed. Other than that, I would move that we approve the resolution 20-03. Do we have a second? I'll second, Commissioner Zielinski. Thank you. Okay, now, now we can move on to a vote. Thank you. Commissioner McGinn? Yes. Commissioner Beck? Yes. Commissioner Zelinski? Yes. Commissioner Tisdell? Yes. Commissioner Holland? Yes. Commissioner Labra? Yes. Yes. Marietta Fack? Yes. Thank you. Okay. Thank you, everybody. And again, thank you, Steve. So that concludes then um, agenda item three. So moving on to item number four, rethink zoning. And I think, is that Dave Tyler? Uh, yes. Uh, good evening. This is Dave Tyler. Uh, and I am here to discuss uh, streets, sidewalks, pedestrian connections. Um, first, uh, hopefully Steve can stop sharing his screen so I can uh, show a presentation here. Steve, are you able to uh, uh, close that down? There we go. Uh, so just a minute here. There we go. Uh, so this is a new chapter in the zoning code, uh, although it's not all new material. Uh, and when we say streets, we're not talking about uh, street standards or street improvement standards. We're talking about street designations. Um, so street improvements, that would be the, the domain of uh, public works and engineering. So quick overview, uh, again, this is a new chapter. Uh, our template for the chapter is uh, existing Metro standards. 
so the metro standards include uh, various uh, streets which have a, a designation, and I'll get into those uh, designations in just a minute. Uh, so what we did was we took the metro standards uh, and as best as we could, uh, extended them out to apply uh, citywide. Uh, I'll show you a map here in just a minute. Uh, public sidewalks uh, are uh, part of this chapter. Um, the, the, the basic standard for sidewalks is in uh, Title 13. Uh, that's the streets title, and that determines when uh, street improvements and included in street improvements, sidewalks, uh, when those are required. Um, and then also in the chapter, there's a, a new section on uh, uh, pedestrian circulation and connections, uh, and that would be sort of on the interior portion of a site or on private property, uh, not within uh, the, the public realm. So here is map 33-1. Uh, this sort of serves as the basis for applying uh, different development standards. Uh, in, in not just uh, the chapter 33, but in other chapters of the code as well. So as mentioned previously, these designations, uh, the street designations would be uh, applied to the city as a whole. You can see in the map here, the big cluster of color, that's Metro. Uh, so those are existing designated streets. And then this map by incorporating the city uh, extends those designations to include uh, some of the arterials down to the south, uh, as well as uh, Broadway. Uh, what's harder to see here are there are some small green segments that are more scattered, uh, and those coincide with some of the uh, smaller uh, pockets of uh, neighborhood commercial zoning. And so the idea there is to ensure that those little commercial nodes are walkable and accessible from the surrounding neighborhood. So again, they, the standards apply mainly to arterial streets, but there are exceptions. Um, and then uh, the street designations are uh, basically our uh, indicator that there are other um, land use and zoning standards that will apply. Uh, and the, the standards uh, that are based on that uh, include uh, public sidewalk standards, uh, which would be, uh, which would supersede the standards in uh, uh, Title 13, specifically with regard to sidewalk width. So here is a blow up uh, of the area where we do have some new proposed street designations. And it's a little blurry, uh, but you can see Evergreen Way is one of them, Everett Mall Way. 19th Avenue Southeast. Um, so those those streets would have a slightly different sidewalk and other development standards uh, than they do today uh, because of these designations. So what are the standards that uh, fall out of having a street designation? Uh, number one, uh, building design, so that would include uh, from chapter, I believe it's uh, 12, uh, weather protection, transparency. Uh, so as you go up the hierarchy in, in the different street designations with uh, TOD streets being the most restrictive, uh, there's greater amounts of uh, weather protection and transparency required. So you have a, you know, sort of a sliding scale based upon uh, how restrictive of a, uh, a street designation you have. Uh, also parking structure design uh, in terms of how much of uh, a structure can front on one of these designated streets uh, it varies depending upon the designation. Uh, landscape requirements, uh, you have a little bit different landscaping for some of the street uh, designated streets and, uh, and that really is related to the location of landscaping and in particular street trees. Uh, and then you have uh, permitted uses which can be affected by street designation. So here's an example from uh, uh, table 5-2. Uh, uh, in our example is automobile fuel sales uh, and then across the top you see different zoning designations and I've only included um, commercial industrial zones here because uh, auto fuel sales would not be permitted in any 
residential zone. So you'll see the P indicates it's permitted, uh, A is administrative use, and the number four is a special regulation, uh, which you can see says that uh, TOD, st TOD streets or pedestrian streets, automobile fuel sales would not be permitted. Um, so if we go back to the designations map, um, TOD would be anything in purple, uh, pedestrian would be anything in red. So uh, between the purple and red designated streets, you would not have automobile fuel sales allowed. Uh, it would be allowed uh, in the same zone, but uh, off that street where uh, there is no similar street designation. And then uh, we also sort of provide a list of the different standards that are driven by street designations. Uh, and that's in table 33-1. I did not include that here uh, because it's a full page table and we would start to lose uh, resolution. But we think this is gonna be a good uh, tool for the public and also for planners because it'll basically you know, inventory uh, all the different standards that are affected by the street designations uh, and put them in one place. And then hopefully uh, once we get it into final format, uh, all the different uh, chapters and sections will be linked so you can so you can navigate out of the table to the different chapters and the standards. Uh, public sidewalks. This is another table from the code uh, from the draft code uh, table 33-2 and a lot of information here but basically you could see the the, the column uh, headers there, for the, that's the frontage zone, pedestrian clear zone, landscape furniture zone, and those coincide with the shaded areas in the image above, um, just to identify uh, what the standards are for those particular areas. So <clears throat> on the left next to the building, the frontage zone, that's the area basically used for ingress, egress into the building entrances. And then in the middle, the orange section, uh, that's that's the main walkway section. That's intended to be a clear zone that does not have you know, obstructions uh, to block pedestrian travel. And then out by the street, uh, you have your landscape furniture zone. That's where your street trees, um, uh, street lights, uh, benches, your garbage cans, other furniture, bike racks, things like that would go there. And uh, this is just kind of a schematic. Uh, every street's different. So not every, you know, every street's gonna have uh, sufficient right of way to put all this stuff. Uh, but these kind of act as standards, but also as guidelines in, in the event that there's not enough room, uh, there are exceptions that are allowed to the, uh, uh, to the zone widths that you see here. So you can see the TOD street uh, uh, on the second column over, from the left uh, has a minimum width for sidewalk width of eight to 10 feet. So that's the greatest standard. Uh, then you go down from there, pedestrian streets, connector streets. Uh, and then as you get down into uh, uh, residential mixed use and undesignated streets, uh, then we defer back to title 13 for, uh, for sidewalk widths and uh, other street improvements. Uh, also, sidewalk treatments are a part of this as well. So uh, I think it's uh, TOD streets as well as uh, pedestrian streets would have a requirement uh, to install uh, various sidewalk treatments, whether it's you know unit pavers or decorative clocks and other furniture. Um, there's a menu essentially in the standards and uh, each development would have to pick two uh, from the menu. Uh, continuing with uh, public sidewalks, um, one of the things that uh, we're doing with these standards is making sure we don't eliminate the higher standards that are uh, currently in the BMU chapter and also the E1 chapter of the code. Um, you have basically eight foot sidewalks plus landscaping in those chapters. Uh, so this is an example. Uh, this is a photo of the Community Health Center on Broadway, so it's BMU zoned. Uh, and the standard there is for a, uh, I believe it's a five foot tree well, 
with an eight foot sidewalk. Um, there may have been, you know, modification or uh, deviation slightly because uh, it looks like the tree well uh, to the building may be a little bit less in this case. But generally speaking, uh, this meets the standard. Another example on Broadway, this is the Starbucks up on uh, North Broadway near the community college. This is fairly recent. I worked on this one, uh, oh, I think it was in 2014, 2013, something like that. So you can see uh, the landscape er area, furniture zone on the left, the uh, pedestrian uh, clear zone walkway, and then a frontage zone to the right. The frontage zone you know, doesn't have specific improvement standards, so there may be you know, a way to put uh, landscaping or uh, pots or uh, benches or other things in that area. And here's a good example of why we need standards. Um, this is Evergreen Way, uh, very pedestrian unfriendly uh, because of the narrowness of the sidewalk. Uh, you can see in the foreground here that it's on a slope because the uh, it crosses a driveway. Uh, and so if you can visualize this section of evergreen with a you know a four foot planter at the curb edge on the right, uh, and then uh, uh, an eight foot sidewalk, it would be six or between six and eight. Um, that would make a world of difference. Uh, and so that's the current E1 standard. And uh, so we're proposing through the street designations uh, and the landscape standards that, uh, that the E1 requirements be retained uh, with a higher sidewalk and landscaping uh, standard. Uh, you can see there are some challenges here uh, too though, and, and those, really are going to have to be handled on a project specific basis. Um, you can see utility poles, uh, lots of uh, 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 signal infrastructure, I think the sig signal poles out there. So in many cases, uh, sidewalk improvements are really going to have to, to work around some of those, uh, so some of those big structures because they're probably not going to be moved. Uh, one other item I wanted to uh, touch on, and that is uh, uh, pedestrian connections that are internal within a site. So we have a, a new section of the chapter, which would essentially require uh, connections uh, between building entrances and the public sidewalk, uh, between buildings or building entrances and parking, as well as to open space and uh, between buildings. Another requirement, this is a new standard. Uh, this is a graphic we took uh, right out of, uh, out of the chapter, is for commercial settings, uh, maintaining a, uh, a clear six foot pedestrian walkway uh, between the building entrance and any parking. Uh, so a couple ways of accomplishing that. One is to put in a wheel stop in the parking area to prevent uh, the bumper from the car from overhanging onto the sidewalk. Uh, and the other is to allow the bumper hang overhang, but just require a wider sidewalk. And so in that case, uh, that would be the example on the right here, you would end up with uh, essentially an eight and a half foot wide sidewalk. So there's an example of what that looks like. Uh, this is an existing shopping center down at uh, 112th and uh, I-5. I think it's called Freeway Center or something like that. And, and this, this layout would really meet that standard. You can see the, the wheel stops, uh, the car bumpers, for the most part, aren't uh, intruding into the pedestrian space. So you got a, a nice, nice wide uh, sidewalk to use there. And, and this building is also a good example of, of what the standards look like uh, uh, in terms of not just uh, pedestrian amenities, but building design. Uh, this has, you know, transparency, it's got the canopies, uh, building uh, mounted lighting. So this would probably be a good example of a project that would meet the, the proposed standards. Um, I think this, this site particularly uh, right now is zone B2. So um, this <laughs> because our new B2 standards, this really exceeds the current requirements. <laughs> Uh, but hopefully uh, we would get more development along the lines of this. Uh, so that's all I have uh, and I am open to questions. Thank you, Dave. Any commissioners with questions or comments?
Uh, yeah, this is uh, Commissioner Lark. I, I just have a quick uh, question. I, I mean, for me, I, after reading some of the public comment that we had and, and having worked on Evergreen Greenway, I'm, I'm very interested in, you know, thinking about how this would impact Evergreen Way. And just a point of clarification, the current standard that you have pictured right there, that does not meet the E1 requirements and sidewalk requirements? That's correct. That's that's an existing uh, five to six foot wide sidewalk. So while it might meet the basic uh, engineering public work standard for a six foot sidewalk, it would not meet the uh, street designation standard for, um, well, it's either going to be a pedestrian street or a, um, I think there was connector one other street. connector street, yeah. correct. So in either case, yeah. uh, it's going to have to have a wider sidewalk with a planter strip. Yeah, if I may say, like having, you know, when, when I used to work on Evergreen, having walked up and down that road, it, you know, the sidewalks are, it, the sidewalks are not very pleasant to use, not very good user experience. And on top of that, it's uh, looking at that photo, there's a lot of instances like that where it's going to be a very difficult, you know, basically to borrow a military term or analogy, it's fighting <laughs> through the hedgerows to, to kind of like correct it. So um, it's not an unenviable task. Um, but, you know, so I do really support putting, you know, uh, improvements between the roadway and the sidewalk. Uh, but my other question is like going back to um, the, uh, you know, kind of like working to make this usable working to improve user experience of the sidewalks there. I mean, one interesting point that a bit of data that I learned from community transit was that, you know, the, the number of trips that occur on the Swift along Evergreen Way are usually two miles long. So it's people commuting from their house to their job or to groceries. So it's very much like a linear downtown, uh, in, so to speak. And the um, my other thought is like, with that, though, we're working to seek, we're, we're working to increase usability. Do these streets uh, designations also come with like a requirement that like future development puts parking lots in back so that stores are front to the streets? Uh, because at the end of the day, like, you know, good road design requires space, place making and space making. And there are certain ratios of between buildings that really facilitate that. Do these streets, do these sidewalk requirements have those requirements that facilitate that? Is my question also clear? Yeah, I think so. Um, uh, and and to try to respond to that, um, if we're talking about parking lot location, that is going to be more a function or more uh, more addressed in uh, Chapter 34, which is the parking chapter. And I believe there is already a standard in there that says for certain streets, we may have called out Evergreen. Uh, that uh, the parking cannot be located between the building and the street. It has to be either behind or offset. Uh, and then uh, as far as um, additional uh, design standards, um, there are certainly pedestrian connection requirements. And so not only do you have to be able to have a walkable public sidewalk, but you have to be able to get to it um, from, from the building or from the development. So we'll make sure that uh, the standards address that, uh, as well as uh, access to transit stops. We need to make sure there's a clear path to the transit stop if one happens to be along the property frontage. Oh, I'm unmuted now. That answers my question very well. Thank you so much. Appreciate okay. it. Thank you. Any additional commissioner questions? Yeah, this is Michael Finch. I had a few questions. Sure. So I'm looking at um, page four of the um, of the memo. This is table 33-1. And it strikes me that the improvements uh, and the restrictions for TOD and pedestrian streets uh, may result in increased cost to a redevelopment than they would to a connector residential or a undesignated street. Um, have these requirements been, uh, have you received feedback from economic development or, uh, or developers on these requirements? Uh, I have not received any direct feedback with regard to the cost of implementing some of these improvements. I do know that as we were drafting some of the uh, building design standards, and many of these are taken 
from uh, uh, the building form and design chapter, chapter 12, uh, that in going through our evaluation, we had not heard uh, from developers any complaints about the cost of uh, some of these standards. And as you recall, many of them are based on current Metro standards. Um, right. and, and so we've had a chance to test those. Um, not a huge number of buildings have been built under the standards, but at the same time, we've not heard a lot of negative feedback about the cost of implementing them. And uh, if, if David Stallheim, you have any additional thoughts or have uh, anybody's reached out to you, feel free to share, but, uh, but I certainly have not heard any complaints. Yeah, this is uh, David Stahlheim, and I'll just uh, point out that the when you look at the street designation maps, there are not any new streets that are designated TOD that were not designated TOD as part of Metro Everett. So there's no additional areas. So the areas uh, um, in purple that are on uh, the map that David's showing right now, there's there's no new additions there. Uh, pedestrian, uh, there there are. Um, um, Dave, pedestrian are red. Uh, so there are some pedestrian connections out on Evergreen Way, but those are all in the areas that are now currently designated as Evergreen uh, mixed use. And so those those uh, standards are are largely in place in all those areas anyhow. But we right. what and we did try to avoid was designating any streets uh, we anticipate when when light rail uh, comes and we have stations located outside of metro is that we would lo be looking at street designation changes in those areas but we didn't apply that until we kind of get through that that process of what's going to happen with light rail in the future yeah yeah I, I think that's wise i mean i guess that from my perspective i, I want to make sure that we are doing what we can to focus development and redevelopment in the areas where we collectively think it's the best to be located. Um, I would hate for new projects to spring up in places where um, that wasn't the intent when, when the goal was to increase the density downtown, for example. Um, and so I think it's, it's wise not to get too far out of our skis relative to, um, you know, what the impact of light rail might be. Um, I just look at these tables and, you know, if rents are approximately the same um, on a per foot basis for apartments, whether you're, um, you know, out near Everett Mall Way or in downtown Everett, but the cost of the building is uh, significantly greater in downtown, um, I would hate to see developers choose more auto-friendly locations as opposed to increasing the density and the retail synergies that come with that density in downtown. So I, want, I just want to make sure that we're, we're thinking about this in a comprehensive manner because I think this is an opportunity to both provide some controls but also incentives to focus development in the right areas. Yeah, and I think that those are the conversations that we had during Metro Everett and the, you know, the if you did an overlay of where those TOD streets are and, and pedestrian st streets, you'll also see that the heights are much taller as well. And so we're, we are providing the developer with a lot more development capacity as well uh, compared to the other areas. Yeah, no, I, I get that. I don't know that the market um, is looking for that level of density or capacity at this point. I think it's, sure. right. at this point it's a project, right? So it's not, it's not going from seven to 20 stories. It's going from zero to seven stories or two to seven stories. Um, and so that, I think that's the, the more narrowed focus, at least for the foreseeable future, um, that we need to be looking at. And I guess a finer question I had relative to table 33.1 was uh, under the TOD, I'm just not quite sure I understand this. If the structured parking integrated with other building, 10% um, of uh, a front building facade. So explain to me what that means. Yeah, what that is referring to um, is the amount of linear frontage that the building has on one of the designated streets. Um, so uh, if, you know, if, if you have a, a structure uh, that happens to have uh, parking, a new building, say, a, you know, an office building or something, and then you've got 
uh, a parking structure which is sort of immediately adjacent to that along the street frontage. Um, these designations would limit the amount of the street frontage uh, that uh, or the linear dimension of the the parking structure along the street frontage. So TOD would be only 10%. So that's pretty restrictive. Uh, whereas uh, Connector Street would be 50% of the, uh, right. so of the in, basically in the building TOD, frontage. Right, so the TOD um, minimum lot uh, dimensions, what would that be, I guess? Is it, is it does the 10% exclude um, parking as a use given that low limitation? Uh, it would make it challenging for sure um, if if it is more of a freestanding parking structure. If it's more integrated into the building design and put underground, no, you could do that because you would still have street level retail, commercial or whatever. So the parking structure wouldn't actually be fronting. It would be underground. Uh, it's only where um, the parking is at grade is my uh, interpretation of this uh, where parking is essentially visible uh, from the street level. I see. So that specific instance would be a parking structure with other uses at street level as opposed to a single purpose parking structure. Correct. Yeah. And this is David Stalheim again. Um, if you recall, we had a somewhat similar conversation about the the depth of the um, how deep a TOD use had to be and so the yep. standards are in the code actually talk about a depth so if you had a 120 foot deep lot 10% um, of the frontage could be in parking but you could have parking still on that ground floor that's back behind but you just have to have an active Ha have active uses along that street front. So right. put your Starbucks cafe, you know, whatever, <laughs> you know, things like that up front. You just don't, you can't have like Ever Park, for example, if that was a TOD street, the, you can't have a whole block that is just nothing but a parking structure. Right. And, and so that indirectly gets at one of the prior questions too about putting parking behind. Uh, this standard might serve that purpose as well. Great, thank you. Okay. Any other commissioner questions or comments? Um, commissioner, uh, this is Commissioner Lava. Do we need to discuss that it's nine o'clock and we're going to extend the meeting? I was just going to raise that. By my clock, I'm showing it's 9:04 p.m. And per Planning Commission rules, I believe um, we we. If, for us to continue past nine o'clock, we do need to have a, a vote. Is is that? Is that my, is that, am I correct in my understanding? That is correct. Okay. Um, so I, I know we're, we're kind of in the middle of something of a, of a, of a topic here and we haven't heard yet many uh, public comment with regard to, to sidewalks, but um, I suppose we should probably put out here to the, to the commissioners um, this issue of, of our nine o'clock ending time. Anyone? This is Commissioner. I'm okay. Mr. Chair, I would just ask how long the staff anticipates to need to con to complete its presentation. We're going to do one other session on uh, the airport, Port and Navy um, after Dave's thing on streets, and we were going to have public input at the end of, of that next session. So I would I would venture to guess the uh, uh, chapter 17 won't take very long. I, I would imagine that we have about another 30 minutes. Uh, my follow-up would be, is it possible to continue this at the next meeting? It is possible to continue at the next meeting. I know that we have at least uh, two folks from the public from the Navy and Port that have been probably waiting patiently. Um, but uh, um, 
they're probably fine with coming on if, as long as we cover their thing first at the next meeting. Mr. Chair, it's your call, I would say. Well, I, 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 I honestly, I, I am concerned about the time. I think, um, one, it's getting late. It's been a long meeting. I wonder about people's ability to really stay focused and if we're losing some of the message here, as well as I know um, people need to, to get home and get back to their lives. So I guess I do have some concerns about continuing maybe uh, throughout for, 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 for a whole half hour, but I, I think it probably would be helpful if we could at least finish this, this section with regard to sidewalk and may, maybe invite any public comment about, about this just to, just to bring this to a close. I, I don't know what the commission thinks about that. I'm okay this, with that. Excuse me. This is, sorry, Michael. This is uh, Commissioner Holland. I would uh, move that we extend the meeting until 9.30, and at which time we uh, close it down. Do you have a second? I'll second that. I suppose, do we need to go to a vote on that? Yeah. Kathy, can you call through? Commissioner McGann? Yes. Commissioner Beck? Yes. <clears throat> yes. Commissioner Tisdale? Commissioner Holland? Yes. Mr. Yes, on Tisdale. I'm sorry, Kathy, I was muted. Okay, thanks. Is that a yes or no? <laughs> Yes. Thank you. Commissioner Labra? Yes. Chair Yanisak? Yes. Okay, then with that, um, with, with, uh, with regard to the sidewalk portion, uh, was there any additional um, commissioner's questions? <clears throat> Okay, not wanting to give anybody short shrift here, but we do only have 21 minutes by my by my clock. Um, so maybe, uh, David, should we move into the airport and Navy compatibility and um, and hopefully have time for some questions? Sure. Yeah, Dave, if you want to uh, exit out of, fantastic. So uh, David Stalheim, uh, and I am going to. Uh, I don't have a PowerPoint, but I have a uh, go to I'm gonna go to the project website uh, and, and walk you through the project website and, and get to this. So if you go to uh, the Rethink Zoning and you go to the Rethink Zoning Library, what we've been doing and getting to the Planning Commission and to the public is that we have is summaries of things, and I kind of like to call them the Cliff Note version of of the code chapters, and so. Uh, this subject is about uh, chapter 17, and so I'm going to open up the chapter 17, and we got a one-page summary. It really says that, you know, first off, that under the Growth Management Act, that we have to do airport compatibility. This is a requirement. Uh, the city adopted the standards back in 2015. Uh, what we're looking at is narrowing the uh, types of land use actions that are subject to uh, the notice on title and the notice to the airport is part of the amendments to Chapter 17 at this time. Um, at the uh, same time, what we're looking at is is doing some things uh, because of staff uh, workload and our, our land use staff. Uh, right now, the code uh, has a the responsibility of staff to make sure that an applicant does all its paperwork with the Federal Aviation Administration. And so we've taken that out, uh, but we've advised the applicant that there are requirements that they have to do and uh, when they're adjacent to the airport. And then when we started talking with the airport last year about uh, this and uh, some of the concerns of staff, we talked about scaling back uh, the projects that give notice to the airport. And so the proposal has uh, notice rather than every development project within about two miles of the airport. Uh, we have projects that are basically the larger projects, 10,000 square feet of gross floor area, 
or or any uh, building uh, that has or structures that are taller than 30 feet. And so these are the types of projects that the airport is mostly concerned with. The very large projects or the tall projects. Uh, they also have worries about uh, anything in the immediate facility vicinity, excuse me, that uh, are hazardous material. And so those are the most uh, uh, the big concerns uh, with them. Uh, at the same time, we've had some conversations over the last couple of years with both the port and Navy and uh, about some compatibility issues. And, and actually, the Navy has some compatibility standards that are already built within Chapter 26 of the code in the M2 zone. And with the code consolidation for the industrial zones, we're going to repeal that chapter. And so what we've done is, is pulled those compatibility standards that basically talk about landscaping and, and some other things that are adjacent to uh, Naval Station Everett to make sure that uh, uh, people, uh, that the, the station is protected from, from people, um, uh, intrusions into, into the Naval base and things like that. Uh, at the same time, the port is concerned about the working waterfront and the impacts on the working waterfront. And we had uh, talked about some standards and some uh, things to do more consultation and notice on titles similar to the airport. And with the COVID-19 and other staff changes uh, at the department, we decided that we needed to back off on some of those provisions for notice on title and uh, have... So the the chapter that you have does not have those those provisions in right now, but it but it does have the same things in the airport that we will will notify both the port and navy when we get those larger projects in the vicinity uh, that we have a land use application uh, and start the consultation uh, as part of, of that process. Do want to uh, note that when you go to our project website, uh, if you get uh, click on the get involved tab. Uh, and this is good for the public, but also for the Planning Commission. You've been getting comment letters, uh, but rather than try to uh, sort them all yourself, we're uh, trying to make it easy on, on you, us, and the public. Um, and so we have all the comment letters are up in a public comment tracker right now. So uh, you'll see that the Port of Everett submitted uh, comments on this subject, um, and Naval Station Everett did. Um, uh, quickly, the Naval Station Everett uh, supports the comments. They have uh, some editorial changes uh, in, in some text there that uh, we've taken a look at, and, and those are things that uh, we'll be glad to try to incorporate in the next draft that we bring uh, back to the Planning Commission for review. Port of Everett's comments, uh, they included some of the, the history of the comments that we have, but they also had a suggestion that uh, that kind of a compromise to uh, rather than a notice on title that uh, we give a similar notice, the same language to applicants. And so you can see that when you uh, look at uh, their comment letter that uh, they suggest uh, some things in there. And so we'll be taking a look at that. I want to consult with our land use staff and the administrative tasks that, that might be involved in before I make a commitment to that. But uh, those are comments that the Port of Everett just uh, submitted today. Uh, also, I just want to uh, note there are other comments. Uh, I know Tina Hokinson is on the line uh, and uh, the comments that uh, Dave uh, had about Chapter 33. And so she has comments that she submitted uh, in detail about some of her concerns about uh, streets and sidewalks and trees along Evergreen Way in particular. So I urge the Planning Commission and the public to take a look at that uh, as well as there's been uh, some other comments that have come in since your last uh, Planning Commission meeting, and uh, most of them uh, based on uh, comments uh, or process. Uh, some of them are uh, focused on uh, some Title 15 procedures uh, that are there, but uh, there are other comments uh, that you've gotten as part of that. So, so with that, uh, that's that's it for for me. I'd be glad to answer any questions that you may have. Thank you, David. Any commissioners with questions for David? Hearing done. Okay, I don't know, David. Did you also address the the follow up for the rethink, or do you think we could put that off to next meeting um, and maybe move to uh, public comment at this time? Yeah, I think we can move on to public comment. Uh, the follow up was for for you folks. If you had any other things from previous meetings, but okay, yeah, we can move on to public comment. Okay, thank you. So at this time, I, I would one. like to. Go ahead. Uh, Sherry Anasak, this is Commissioner Lark. I just have one follow-up for the uh, 
the rethink. And uh, I just want to throw it in here really quick. Um, one of the things, you know, I'm sorry I wasn't able to attend the, uh, the meeting on June 2nd. Um, and I, re I watched it, I reviewed it, I looked through the, uh, the plan. And one of the things I think that, I think it's a good plan, and I think it reaches out to North Everett, South Everett, and to the neighborhoods, so that outreach is good. But one thing I think we need to explicitly and intentionally do is reach out to dis traditionally marginalized and disenfranchised communities who've been locked out of housing and access to housing, and traditionally communities who've been disproportionately impacted by redlining. And uh, so until we do that, I, I mean, I think that is a huge missing missing gap in the required outreach for our, our rethink zoning when it comes to like, as we prepare and think about, you know, the housing component that's going on further down the line. And then I'll leave my final thought is that I know at the top of the meeting, David mentioned the 2024 timeline for addressing single family housing. Uh, I have some concerns about that. I think it's a little too far out. Um, one of the biggest challenges, one of the biggest missed steps that we had in the last decade was post 2008 recession. We had a we had bad housing policy, and we continue to have you know unsupportive housing policy that that constrains economic growth and opportunity and wealth building. And as we seek to recover from a COVID depression or recession, making sure that we have good housing policy that allows for growth and equitable growth is essential. So I don't think 2024 it would be a viable timeline to start you know tackling that issue. Um, so I really like to get a commitment from the planning department that you know to reach out and have a um, have a meeting and a community based meeting that gets that gets inputs from communities that have been traditionally marginalized or excluded from housing markets and have just been disproportionately impacted by redlining. Thank you. So with that, I I know we are running up against our our deadline of of 9:30 tonight. Don't want to. Um, not hear from from people who have been waiting and, and from people from the public who have comments. So if we could call through, this would be your opportunity to comment about anything that we've talked about here on the agenda tonight, as well as anything that's not on the agenda. But I uh, do ask you to be respectful of, of everybody's time. And um, so Kathy, could you call through uh, our guests? Yes. Uh, Glennis Casey. Yes, Laura Gurley. Yes, ma'am. Can you guys hear me? Yeah. We can hear you. Uh, this, this is Laura Gurley with the Port of Everett. Uh, thank you. And uh, I wanted to commend Dave. He's been very collaborative and very proactive with making sure that we know when uh, new versions of this proposed code change is coming out. So uh, thank you for that, Dave. Um, we did submit a round of comments back in February, and that is what is posted on the website that they've showed you right now however i did send in new comments based on the most current round of um uh the draft that came out on june 4th but dave and i were having technical issues so that is not posted on the website yet i hope we got it figured out after about six o'clock tonight um so it's in dave's inbox so hopefully you will be able to see those soon um and one just other comment that we I didn't point out in my comment letter, I totally understand that city staff is completely pinched for um, just having enough people to do the job. I think a lot of uh, entities, especially public agencies, are feeling that right now. Um, but that won't last forever, and hopefully not as long as this code is going to be in effect. So I think we also need to be forward thinking for how much longer longer the code changes that we're proposing right now are going to be in effect um, as opposed to the city being short staffed. So I uh, think long range on that too relative to some of the changes that we proposed. And that's it for me. Thank you so much. Thank you. Can you hear me? Yeah. Yeah. So, for Naval Station Everett, I just want to express an appreciation for the Planning Commission and your considered review, and also to thank staff for their uh, collaboration with 
Naval Station Everett in the update process, and I'm looking forward to continued discussions. Um, I'm, I'm not sure how this meeting is going to proceed forward, but um, you have I, Captain Davis support letter and uh, I guess that's the end of my comment and I thank you. Thank you. Thank you. It's Mel Mohammed. Kathy, you were breaking up a little bit on my end. I think you called this Ismail Muhammad. Yes. Okay. He's coming on. Mr. Muhammad. How about extension seven one seven? Can you hear me? Sorry. Oh, there you are. There's oh, I'm Mr. sorry. Muhammad. I was on mute. Uh, this is Ishmael Muhammad. Sorry, no comment at this point. Thank you. Thank you. Okay, extension 7187. Yeah, this is uh, Dylan Sluter with the Master Builders Association. I appreciate the commission's time looking at it and staff's time on uh, rethink zoning. Uh, I know with COVID, it's, it's caused some uh, difficulties, with, uh, and I look forward to reengaging on this. I know I met with uh, David Stahlheim and Alan earlier on, but obviously with the issues we're facing with COVID, I sort of transitioned into focusing on the permit extensions and things that were urgent uh, and demanding of that. But I'm looking forward to re-engaging uh, and being a part of this process and hopefully getting more developers' in, uh, participation. And on this, I know uh, Commissioner Finch had some great points as well as Commissioner Lark. It's just when we look at this policy, I, I know that there's struggles with funding, but I, I think that we should look at doing the most we possibly can. Uh, and I know some of the single family zones, there were some positive changes that were influenced from House Bill 1923 and the funding that came from that. And uh, unfortunately, it looks like that's going to be put off for a little while, but I hope that it does come back sooner rather than later. And uh, again, I just look forward to being a part of the process and I thank you all for all your work. Thank you. Uh, lastly, Tina Hokanson. Hi, um, I just want to uh, say thank you to David and um, I, it's been so much easier this time to follow along um, on the web with and access the documents in the library and love all the links, very much appreciate all the work um, and the responsiveness uh, of you and the rest of the staff. And I will have more to say, I'm sure, on, on um, uh, sidewalks and trees and the experience of people on the on the street. And especially, I'm I'm very interested, of course, in um, along Evergreen Way. Thank you. Thank you. That would be uh, the list. We're done. Okay, great. Thank you. And I would just remind everybody that if you didn't get a chance to, to speak up about it or the comment, you can always send an email or, or a letter um, to the planning department and that, that will get before the commission and, and can get pushed to the website. Uh, do we have any other business as we come to a close here? Staff or commissioners? Yes, uh, Mr. Chairman, this is Alan Giffen. And I just wanted to say as my uh, last official planning commission meeting as a staff member, uh, I want to say thank you to the commissioners for the job that you do. Uh, our jobs as staff and, st and city planners uh, is dependent upon the direction and the guidance that you provide. Uh, we appreciate that you do this uh, out of the love of your community. It's an uh, <laughs> unpaid volunteer job and uh, the many hours that you put into preparation for meetings and participation in the meetings is very much appreciated by the staff as well as uh, administration and city council. Your advice as a, uh, a filter for the uh, city council is a very important function for all of these policy and, and property planning, uh, infrastructure planning decisions that uh, you make over the 
course of the years. And so um, I want to say how much I've appreciated the Planning Commission. I've worked with many good commissioners over the years, and uh, you guys uh, just uh, really make our jobs that much easier because you uh, of your engagement and, and your uh, caring for the community. And so uh, with that, I'm going to say thank you uh, to all of you. Thank you to the public uh, and uh, to staff for uh, great support over the years. Well, th thank you, Alan. It's been a marathon tonight. We've, we've kept you here, I think, as long as, as long as we possibly can. And I know it, it's been um, what, what I've seen, your, your contributions to the city and, and the legacy you leave is, is very appreciated. And, I guess we hope that uh, maybe we won't see you sitting behind the desk, but maybe we'll see you in the audience in, at future meetings. <laughs> any, any other business or comments from commissioners? Anyone? This is, Commissioner that, Zalin, this is Commissioner no, Zelinski. I just wanted to uh, respond in kind to Alan. For the five years or so I've been on the commission, uh, Alan and his staff have done a great job of helping the commissioners get through these uh, sometimes difficult questions that are put to us. And uh, the guidance that uh, that he and uh, David have done through the years have been really made our jobs on the commission much easier, I think. So thank you guys both. Thank you. Thank you. Anyone else? to say as um, this is Tina Hokanson when I worked for the county um, Alan was very much um, appreciated by staff who worked with him from the county also um, he is very much admired so thank you for your service Alan we're gonna miss you thank you All right, everybody, thank you for your attention and time this evening. Um, we got through a lot of business, and uh, we will see you soon. Uh, we will call this meeting adjourned. <laughs>